Welcome again, everybody. I'm still getting used to that sort of start to things. Um, it is Sunday, of course, Sunday afternoon here in the northeast corner of the world's most beautiful country, South Africa. And um, one thing that wasn't introduced to you during that little beginning was the thumb. Brian, what is the thumb today? A pirate fisherman. A pirate fisherman thumb, which of course is very appropriate for the dry conditions that we're experiencing here in the... <laughs> low felt of northeastern South Africa. Behind me, some kudu. Let's have another look at them. You're on a live safari. Oh, no, there were, <laughs> there they are. Uh, you're on a live safari, like I said, and that means we'd love to talk to you during the course of the next three hours. Hashtag Safari Live, questions at wildearth.tv. Got a great treat for you this afternoon, just firing himself up and seeing if he can get Rusty to work, the uh, great Duke of Sydney, Hayden Turner, and he's going to be greeting you hopefully very shortly and hopefully with some animals down at the Juma Pan. We're going to head to the south, see if we can find Karula. She killed an impala this morning, went back to fetch the cubs, and that will happen sort of between drives. So with any luck, we'll find her, and we'll have a wonderful afternoon spent with the cats. Who knows? We may just stare at this kind of a wintry landscape for most of the afternoon, but with any luck, we'll have some cats and some elephants and various other things. Um, this morning... A very brief sighting of Karula, as far as I'm aware, with Brent. Uh, we were on foot and we had a lovely walk, and it was just a very sort of Sunday vibe about the place. It was quiet, and it was uh, just very pleasant, and it is pleasant now. About, I think, if I'm not mistaken, about 27 degrees Celsius, 80 degrees Fahrenheit, which is a very pleasant temperature indeed. There's a wind blowing out of the northwest, which is a typical August wind. And this is the kind of conditions that are going to prevail for most of the next month. There's some Nya, uh, Impala. Those are Impala, aren't they, Brian? They are Those ones there. Quite common. And if you are a new viewer, please do talk to us. Tell us you're a new viewer. Uh, we shall greet you fondly. And tell us where you're from. It's always so nice to hear where people are from. nice what we call breeding herd or nursery herd of impala and all those females now carrying their babies heading into the difficult time a of the pregnancy and b of the dry season and as those fetuses grow obviously the nutritional demands on the mothers become that much higher and so it is that they will have to find more and more to eat seven months gestation period which ends about the same time with any luck for them as the rainy season begins here at the end of November. And you can't believe looking at that vegetation now especially in the harshness of this light which will soften as the afternoon goes on you can't believe that they've got enough to eat there. One or two dry but some cumbretum or bush willow leaves I'm sure they're eating. There is a flush of green grass as a result of a little bit of rain we had three weeks ago. They're eating that too. And one or two other leaves and they're one of the few species that is able to browse and graze. We had a lovely discussion this morning on foot about the difference between browsing and grazing. Grazing of course eating grass plants, browsing eating the leaves off the trees and shrubs and it requires a slightly different digestive process and a different suite of enzymes to do one or the other. Some very lucky ones, like these impala, are able to do both readily. Some, like the zebra, not so much. Just about all the grazers will do a little bit of browsing if they have to, but they don't derive the same nutrition from it as they do from the grass. And the grass, of course, doesn't have the same level of uh, sort of protective chemicals, if you like, defensive chemicals. That's what you need to cope with if you happen to be a browsing antelope. Right, that's enough of that. Let's carry on. I'm not entirely sure where the leopard is, so it might take a little bit of effort to find her, but I think she's around here somewhere. Brent is going to be driving out of Wuyatela tonight, so he'll uh, help me get in there eventually because he knows where she killed. 
So with any luck, we'll hear him in our ears fairly shortly. And the news is that Hayden has managed to get his car going. He's got his earpiece in his ear, his microphone in his hat, and he will shortly greet you. You'll just have to be a little bit patient. And if you're wondering, I'm sure you've seen that thing in front of us there. That is the solar pump. I'll show you now as we go past it. A completely silent solar pump that lives in this little hutch. And that's where our water comes from. You wonder often in a dry climate like this where we get water from. Well, it comes from a well under the ground, or what we call a borehole. It's pumped up by that solar pump. It's completely silent, and it's a much, uh, it's a vast improvement on the great diesel thumper that used to be out here uh, when I first arrived, and uh, making a big that 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 noise. And at this time of the year, you can hear it from miles away. No longer. Hello, Ravi. Um, I don't think I've heard from you for a while. You're in New York. You say you've seen a few young impala around, and is that difficult or unusual for the mothers? Is that correct? I think I, that was your question. Going to wait for Rebecca to confirm it. Yes, there we are. Um, uh, Ravi, there are no newborn impala at the moment. There are some yearlings, and there are probably one or two that were born in uh, February or March, so they'll be slightly smaller than the others. They will have finished, um, almost certainly finished suckling completely, so it doesn't make any difference to the mothers at the moment. Uh, they're on their own. Yes, they will have a difficult time finding sufficient to eat, uh, simply because they are younger, obviously. But, yeah, I mean, I think they're pretty much in the same boat as the rest of the impala. It's quite interesting to think, you know, without the experience of a year, uh, do they know what to eat when, and how do they learn that? Is it entirely instinctual, or do they follow the examples of their mothers? I don't know the answer to that, but I'd say if you, as long as they were weaned, which all of the impala will be at this stage, as long as they're weaned, there's going to be no kind of difference between uh, the survival or the difficulty with which they'll survive. Nice question, as always, Ravi. All right, everybody, the Duke of Sydney is now ready to receive you. Hop onto his vehicle, say hello to him fondly, and I shall hopefully see you later with the leopard. Well, my dear friends, welcome to Safari Live, and it is so good to be back. My name is Hayden Turner. I'm sorry I've got my sunglasses on, I'm staring straight into it, but it's so great to be back here. And uh, for you, those of you who I've never met before, my name's Hayden, as I just said. Um, I've come across from Australia. I was here a few years ago and throughout last year with this incredible team on Safari Live, and I've been really, really lucky for them to have me back, if I behave myself. Um, I'll get a little bit more to you about my story through the, tr through the, the day or the afternoon. And if uh, you've got any questions, of course, send us those questions and um, <clears throat> we'd l love to answer them as much as we possibly can. And you know, I haven't been here for seven months, so I'm gonna be relying on you. There's two really important things about uh, Safari Live. It's the beautiful wildlife and the habitat, of course, but equally as important is you, the viewer. We would not be here without you. And I rely on you hugely, because if I've been away for seven months, I can't remember what the Nkahuma Pride's doing. I know that they've got beautiful cubs. I might need you to help me with that. Uh, the leopards and all that sort of thing. So I really rely on you. This is a, a joint drive. You've just gotten on the biggest safari vehicle on the planet. And uh, it makes me very, very proud to be here. Uh, and oh gosh, there's so much to talk about. I'll tell you all about what I've been up to in the last seven months as well. But um, just to talk about our little friend here before he uh, goes away, uh, James was just talking about uh, nutrition and uh, 
sort of how people are people <laughs> how animals digest and uh, this is probably one of the least efficient compared to those impalas that he was talking about and James was mentioning I think about impalas being ruminants well ruminants are probably the most efficient group of, of ungulates or hoofed animals uh, in the world for that matter um, and they have such a great success story with what the, the what they get out of their food now um, elephants on the other hand have to eat and consume That is very disconcerting that we've lost signal with Rusty. Rusty was our go-to girl. Anyway, we haven't found the leopard yet. You didn't give me much of a chance, but we will try. And I'm sure Hayden will be back up and running shortly. Now, the kill apparently was somewhere around here today. I think it's just the other side of Treehouse Dam in a very nasty knob thorn thicket. I had a tracker once. He was the, is the most wonderful fellow and he spoke, he was a Mozambican refugee, so he spoke almost no English, never set foot in a school in his life, taught himself to read and write, remarkable guy. And with things like knob thorn, you know, if, if you learn to speak basic English, you're not gonna learn what a knob is, you might learn what a thorn is, but it's unlikely, you know, you're gonna learn the practical things of what helps you to live in everyday life. And so things like knob thorn, false marula, all of those sorts of things were just approximations, but you didn't worry about whether he could actually uh, say them or not. So a knob thorn thicket became a knob thorn stick. And whenever there was a leopard in a knob thorn stick, he and I would giggle quietly because he knew that um, he wasn't saying it correctly, but it was, it was just rather amusing the way he used to say it. It was knob thorn stick and a false marula was a fox marul. Fox marul. Now, I think it's in this rather heinous amount of knob thorn over here, if I'm not mistaken. Because when Brent was following her, she kind of crossed along through here, I think, and then they lost her in some thick bush. I might be wrong. We'll just wait for them to get mobile. There is an impala up ahead. He looks very relaxed. <laughs> he also looks quite surprised to see us. Looking behind him is his friends who have absconded into the bushes. There's a squirrel there, Brian. Just beautifully lit there. Sorry. It was off to the left. It's gone now. There we go. Left hand side under the tree there. Just over there, you see the tree that's fallen to there. I'm Paul in the Netherlands. Thank you for getting hold of us. You say you were recently in the Kruger. That's good news. You just saw a flash of squirrel there. And you say, are the Impala and Kudu staying in the same places or are they moving around? Paul. The limiting factor for is an impala is the fact that it is sedentary. It is unable to migrate, and so they have to stay in one place. And you'll find that their condition is pretty good. They'll cope with a drought as long as there's water for them to drink, which sounds incongruous, but obviously much of the water in this area is pumped. And so then they can go and drink pumped water. They absolutely survive, but they can't move. They're not nomadic, and uh, so they, they must stay in one place. Kudu, probably slightly less so, but Kudu, you see, are not water dependent. Kudu can live almost without water, and so they don't need to migrate to and from water or follow the grazing like the wildebeest do. They will normally just stay kind of in one area with their home range. They're not territorial, but their home range will increase um, as the dry season progresses, as the sort of um, grey or browse becomes less and less concentrated. Hello Abhishek, lovely to hear from you again. You say do we have Elant here? We don't have Elant, 
Uh, we used to have eland, or the Sabi sand used to have eland here. You'll probably find that one eland wanders across here every sort of three or four uh, years. Uh, they are found in the Kruger. They are more a dry, a dry desert area species, but in an area where there are lots of impala and lots of pumped water, they cannot compete with the impala and the zebra, and so they tend to move away. There are potentially some here. There's a water buck sleeping there, which indicates to me that the leopard is not close by. Do you see the water buck there? Isn't that a nice brown? Well spotted. And you can see the water buck still chewing his Sunday lunch. What do you think he had, Brian? Ooh, a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Roast chicken? Uh, probably. Do you think so? Mm, no. No. Apple crumble? Yes, definitely. Definitely apple crumble. Yes. Mm. That's what he's chewing on right now. That's what he's having now. Of course, a water buck must re-chew his apple crumble. You'll see him now. Vomiting into his own mouth. There we go. Very nice. Dessert times two. Yum, yum. Wish I was a ruminant. There are two of them there, of course. A water buck doesn't have four ears. There are, in fact, two water buck there. And that a young male with his little horns. He's probably about four months old only. And interestingly, they are, tend to be, well, they're not a-seasonal breeders, but they are breeders that, um, well, they, they tend to, they will have a peak of birth during the rainy season. But, for example, you'll never find a four-month, highly unlikely you'd find a four-month-old impala now, or even a kudu. So they tend to give birth at just about any time of the year, or the peak during the rainy season. Very nice, Brian. What did you have for Sunday lunch, Brian? Um, a, chop. a chop. Very nice. Did you have um, apple crumble? I didn't. You didn't, no, nor did I. No, I didn't see any. Yeah. Well, that must have been. Sausages for breakfast. Delicious. <laughs> Rebecca just panicked everybody. She thought she'd missed out on apple crumble. But I was just kidding. We didn't actually have apple crumble today. <laughs> Would have liked to have had apple crumble. No. I'm not seeing any evidence of a leopard here. I think it was in, if I'm not mistaken, it's in this rather heinous block here that she killed. And so I think that's probably where she is and I'm expecting to find her tracks kind of coming across the road here fairly soon. With any luck. But we'll just do a loop around Brent said, during his, <laughs> during his closing, he said, well, isn't that nice? We've got guaranteed leopards for this morning. One doesn't want to guarantee anything like that, I feel, because then they will almost certainly do something that you don't expect them to. But I think in this case, he's probably right. Hello Mike, you're wondering about the Olympics and uh, which teams we support and which sports are our favourite. Uh, Mike, uh, well the only team I can possibly support is Team South Africa of course. Unfortunately we don't have a very proud Olympic record, in fact it's something uh, fairly dire. Uh, this year we do have a chance in the rugby, because rugby sevens has been reintroduced to the Olympics, so that's what I'll be watching with great interest. We do have one sprinter who seems to be able to run the 100 metres in slightly less than 12 seconds, which is pretty fast for us. We might have a chance of a few medals in the swimming. We're normally pretty good at that. But, you know, we send a fairly small team, and in disciplines like gymnastics and much of, many of the athletic disciplines, we don't generally have much representation. Uh, so we'll follow Team South Africa. 
Um, and I mean, I enjoy the athletics quite a lot. Do you like anything specific in the Olympics, Brian? Mm, I quite enjoy javelin, discus, shot put. Do you? The, the field events, because of course, Brian, you were a spear thrower, weren't you? I was. Brian used to throw the spear for his school. I was. Did you? Yeah. And you were high jumping, of course. A little bit. Being quite high yourself. Yep. Yes. I wasn't really built for those, everybody. I wasn't ever asked to put the shot, fling the javelin, or toss the discus. I could jump quite a long way there, Brian, you know, for somebody of my proportions. Mm. Oh, thousands of meters. I've always thought... <laughs> I just want to do something quickly here. I mean, I don't know where this leopard is, but I just, on the subject of the Olympics, I just want to, I just want to show you something. I'm not going to do anything athletic, but I want you to imagine that your career is this, okay? This is what you do for a living. Your sole purpose in life is to do what I'm going to do now. You run along like this, and then you go like this. That's your job. Triple jump. Uh, it's, it's the most random thing in the world, don't you think? I quite enjoyed it. Yes, but who came <laughs> up with it? Imagine just saying to somebody, well, 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 you know, what's your job? No, I'm a triple jumper. I hop twice and then jump. That's what I do for a living. I've always thought it the most incongruous thing. Anyway, that's just, <laughs> that's just me. Hop, hop, skip, jump. Nice job. <laughs> you know, the kind of long jump and the high jump and the sprint, I can get the point. I can get the point, but the, the triple jump, I just, I can't get my head around it. Oh, here we go. We've got some action here, everybody. Brent do, or Aubrey or Herbert to copy. I'm just going to try and get an idea from them. Because I don't see nothing at this stage. From the sounds of the radio this morning, this is where they were looking. Hooray! Let's go back across to Hayden. He has both signal and picture. So, folks, let's try that again. Uh, <laughs> we're just still with our young, very tolerant bull friend here, really beautiful boy. I'm just going to sit back here. Hey, my boy. That's okay. It's okay, my boy. It's okay, my boy. I'm just going to sit with him and uh, just watch him for a little bit. We just had a little bit of a hiccup uh, a second ago um, with our our power supply, but uh, luckily I'm with one of the the most seasoned veterans of uh, Safari Live camera uh, operation, and that is VM, and he sorted it out. And VM and I have worked together for many years now, and uh, I also call VM my eyes in the sky because VM has got some of the most fantastic sightings with me. Um, I've ever experienced and I wouldn't have been able to do it without him so wonderful to be working with VM this morning and everyone in FC and all the whole team is just great to be back but whilst we are um, got this beautiful creature in front of us um, I just want to go back to what James was saying before how incredible uh, these animals are and what they are uh, consuming at the moment because as you can see the surrounds are very very dry we are not just in the middle of winter here in South Africa but um, Right, well, that wasn't a great start, but uh, well, a second start, but at least there was some picture. Not sure what's going on there. Might take Wendy back to Hayden and give, him t give her to him so that he can have a bit of a practice and then we can maybe take a walk. 
But let's see first if we can't find this leopard. We still don't have any mobility from Brent or Aubrey. Brian, you will tell me if you see the leopard, won't you? Thank you. Thank you very much. I do appreciate it. One should be able to see the swathe of destruction. Okay, everyone, apparently we are going to do a swap. We're going to give Hayden this car, and I will take a little walkies. Alrighty, so I'm just going to drive slowly through here, just see if we can't pick it up, and then we'll go and hand Hayden the vehicle, and we'll go on a little walkies. That will be Viam and I. Brian, I'm afraid our time together is coming to an end. Isn't that sad? Are you devastated? What do you mean a little bit? That's very sad that you're only a little bit devastated. I saw that. I saw you doing that, Brian. Okay, let's take the car back to Hayden and he can come and resume the search. Possibly with the help of Leo Smith. Hold on, Brian. Just because you're a little bit sad, I might drive you through a bush or two on the way home. I'm just going to ask Rebecca to tell Hayden maybe to meet us um, on quarantine, perhaps. That will be uh, a more attractive place to do the swap over, I think, than on uh, at the in the workshop. Otherwise, we'll just see him in the workshop. Sorry about this, everybody. It is just part of what happens when you're out here. Um, glitches happen on a daily basis. It is just part of operating with very delicate equipment in pretty trying conditions. Lots of bumps, lots of dust, varying temperatures. And that's just how it goes. Well, I just hope that we can sort it out during the course of the afternoon, of course. We've got those wonderful, uh, Hayden will tell you about them later, but we've got this wonderful initiative with the, about 80 Australian schools tomorrow morning. And it would be very sad not to be able to give them the full show. Anyway, so it goes. We'll just drive a little bit quickly so we can affect the swap fast. Some impala up ahead. Oh, I just wanted to quickly show you this tree. Sorry, everyone. Oh, well, I'm not sorry, actually. I'm going to show it to you anyway. There, this tree, which I'm hoping is going to bear fruit, and Raisa and Jeffrey told us about the tree. It's a sausage tree. It's just getting its new leaves already, astoundingly but it didn't produce any fruit or flowers last year, I think on account of the lack of rain. Anyway, so let's keep an eye on that. That's the sausage tree, Kigilia Africana. Nice, Brian, well done. Hello, Wild Earth girly. Um, <laughs> you're wondering if we grow rhubarb here. I'm, uh, probably because we were talking about apple crumble, you were wondering this. Um, I've met a few people who've grown rhubarb. Uh, my father used to eat rhubarb every so often when we were kids with custard. Um, I've had it a few times in a crumble. I don't know anybody who grows it. Uh, maybe Rebecca would like to grow it in her garden, which currently has one emaciated weed growing out of it. Rebecca, I think you should maybe make an attempt to grow some rhubarb. She says she'll, she's going to do that and then she'll make all the delicious pies. The delicious pies I believe that she can make. I'm yet to see any evidence of her uh, green fingeredness. 
She's very good at creating deserts, though. She's created a small Gobi desert just outside her door. It's very impressive. <laughs> anyway, there's the Mahindra in front of us. I'm not sure where that's going. now leaving a lot of dust in our way. It might be Brent going to take his game drive. Righty. Now Hayden should be just around the corner here. going to be covered in dust from Mahindra. Do you see Hayden anywhere, Brian? I don't. I don't see him either. I see him not. Perhaps he will emerge from behind the tree. Rebecca, where is Hayden? We don't know where he is. We're going to have to go down to the to the workshop to find out. He might be that side. We should just look here quickly, just for in case. Do you see him, Brian? No. He might have become invisible. Would have done on down and look here. There he is. I see him, everyone. Hello there. A lift? Well, I think I'll just give you my car, if that's all right. There we are. Okay, everybody, we're going to go to a technical loop now for the next five minutes while we do the little swap over. We'll see you on the flip side of this. Sorry about this, everybody. Perhaps something has pushed over the Gauri repeater, just like the elephants have pushed over this marula tree. Our technical team is rushing around, madly trying to fix it, and we'll be back with you as soon as we can. Hi everyone, we are experiencing technical difficulties, but please bear with us. Our engineering department and our tech department will be working on getting us back up and running as quickly as possible. As you know, bringing you live safaris from the middle of the African bush is not always the easiest task in the world. But we will be back up and stick with us, because you never know what might be on your screen when we return to you.
So unfortunately, we're experiencing tech difficulties. That's one of the things about being alive and in the bush. But our tech crew is on it and not asleep like the lions behind me. Hopefully, we'll be back with you shortly. Sorry about this everybody, perhaps something has pushed over the Gauri repeater, just like the elephants have pushed over this marula tree. Our technical team is rushing around madly trying to fix it and we'll be back with you as soon as we can. Hi everyone, we are experiencing technical difficulties, but please bear with us. Our engineering department and our tech department will be working on getting us back up and running as quickly as possible. As you know, bringing you live safaris from the middle of the African bush is not always the easiest task in the world. But we will be back up and stick with us, because you never know what might be on your screen when we return to you. So unfortunately we're experiencing tech difficulties, that's one of the things about being alive and in the bush, but our tech crew is on it and not asleep like the lions behind me. Hopefully we'll be back with you shortly. Well, shall we try that again? I think it's probably a wise move to try that all over again, right from the beginning. Welcome to Safari Live. My name's Hayden Turner. I haven't been back here for seven months, and it is absolutely brilliant to be here. James has been incredibly honourable in his uh, giving up of the vehicle, but he's going to go on a bushwalk for us, which is also fantastic because he's great in the bush and uh, show us a lot of the small things and the really intimate things that we miss when we're on game drive. Um, I've swapped, and I'm now with Mr. Brian Joubert. And uh, that's always a good thing, too. Um, I need to reinstate my friendship with my good friends here that I've been... I've seen so many great, great sightings and encounters we're here with, and we were just sort of reminiscing... Uh, reminiscing before. Just excuse that... Um, that Game Drive channel there. Just let me carry on for a second. So where we were was just down the bottom here with a couple of elephants, and I'll tell you a little bit about what I've been up to... Uh, as we move along here. But for people that I've never met before, um, really nice to meet you. And for old viewers that, uh, and super fans that have been here of Safari Live, super fans that have seen this show for many, many mo more moons than I ever have, really big hello to all of you. And, uh, you know, equally, you are both here on the biggest safari vehicle on the planet. And uh, what an incredible honor it is to be back working with this, this wonderful team. So, 
I uh, just want to also give a little shout out to my beautiful wife who's watching from Australia and uh, tell her that thank you for letting me go for a month because I've been in Namibia before this and then I'm going back to Namibia after this but I just wanted to come across and I also wanted to have a little uh, chat to you quickly about why I in initiated this uh, this week. Now, the we are really, really we are really, really looking forward to broadcasting live to some Australian schools. Now, those Australian schools, we've worked really hard with the Taronga Education Department, the zoo that I'm currently working at. Uh, to craft this little week of, of stories from Africa for these kids, a lot of them in rural and remote areas. We've got about 80 schools on board at the moment and it's growing daily. Tomorrow morning we broadcast live to, to Australian afternoon. Just let me keep my eyes out for these Ellies wherever they were. So just whilst I'm driving I'll tell you the little story there. And we're going to do the first hour, six till seven, uh, well, 6 to 7 in tomorrow morning of our morning drive, and Australia will pick that up. These school kids will pick this up at 2 to 3 p.m. Uh, their afternoon, and they're really excited. We've got them on board. They're going to experience uh, the magic of Safari Live, and I think that's a really, really important thing. You people that know me uh, that are with us today, you know how passionate I am about children's education, and you know how important I think it is, and we all do at Safari Live. So um, this is a great initiative, just like we've done in Virginia Beach and all the other places in the States, and also the Surrey Wildlife Trust uh, that I did a couple of years back as well. So it's just great. It's just exciting. I'm really excited to be back, as if you can't gather that through my voice. So there was a beautiful young elephant bull here a minute ago, and we just try and find him. We've got a really, really great question, and I've just got a bit of goosebumps here at the moment because if it is the same 11-year-old girl that I'm thinking, it's Sabrina. Sabrina, I just, I need to just firstly tell you folks, I'm just trying to turn this game drive channel down, guys. I do apologize. Um, the guys are just talking in the background there. Sabrina, I'm going to stop the vehicle up here with a beautiful elephant in the background and he's a big bull as well. So we'll just gently get up here and Sabrina, I'm coming to give my, uh, oh, look how beautiful. This is, he's got a floppy ear, this guy as well. I've seen this guy before. Very interesting. Let's just gently, gently go up here. It's okay, my boy. He's probably going to come up and uh, have a drink. And, uh, oh, you can smell him too. He smells fantastic. He's got a really little floppy ear, that, that guy. So we'll just stop here and uh, we'll just see if he's going to make his way up. He could have damaged that ear uh, when he was younger, or even older for that matter, and some of the, the, um, the tissue that is very, very... Uh, powerful around the base of that ear that allows them to flap the ear. It could have been damaged in something. It could have been a fight. It could have been uh, anything or just you just don't know when it's happened to, to him. But he's a beautiful boy, that's for sure. Got some great, great uh, tusks there. He's having a little sniff of the air. Arguably the most versatile herbivore in in the world, I think, and, and you know, the Asiatic elephant and also what we have here, of course, the African elephant, but absolutely incredible. They've got to reach about another probably 15 to 20 feet, about, you know, six meters higher than giraffe, uh, and they can exploit all the vegetation that giraffe can't even reach. So incredible ability to uh, exploit the vegetation and survive in these really tricky times that we're in right now. But he's a magical, magical boy, isn't he? So I'm going to just position the car so you can have her, have him in the background. I just want to get to Sabrina because this is very exciting for me and I'm going to tell you the story why. So Brian, you tell me when there's a good spot for you, mate. Is that good? Okay. 
and I'm going to trust you to watch my back here because I'm facing camera, so I'm getting Brian to be my eyes in the sky. Sabrina, how fantastic to have you on board, my friend. 11 years of age, and you want to know why some animals can survive without with water and some have a bit more trouble. Well, the first thing I need to give everyone a little bit of a backstory about Sabrina. Sabrina, you touched my heart, matey, when you asked a question one day. You said, uh, I think we were all driving around, I think it was potentially Brian last November, maybe Big Cat Week or something, or it might have been, yeah, I think it was. And you asked a question, you asked, um, can girls do this? My friend, I think the answer I gave you was absolutely girls can do anything. That was the first thing I told you. And hopefully uh, that pumped you up a little bit to follow your dreams because you sound like you watch this a lot, matey. And I'm so, so glad to have you on board. You really made my day. So some animals, to get to your question now, some animals have the ability to... Um, uh, adapt their behavior. Now, for example, James was talking earlier this morning about impala and saying that they predominantly grazes when grass is around, but they will also browse when it comes to it. But buffalo will do that as well. When there's very limited vegetation, if they're a, a grazing animal uh, predominantly, and there's times are really tough like it is now, some animals will change their behavior and start to eat other things. They also have very, very clever behaviors. Um, uh, elephants know and they'll pass that information on to uh, other elephants to, for where to find water, they'll dig for water. Uh, the matriarch normally knows that information and she might lead the, uh, the, the herd, uh, breeding herd to water and then pass that information on. So lots of different animals have different ways of doing it. Um, some antelope, particularly uh, and there's an antelope in Namibia that I've just been with uh, for the last 10, 12 days called uh, the Oryx or the Hemsbok and they can become what we call water independent and they don't actually need to drink. Um, there are some parts of Africa as well where giraffe don't have any water at all and sometimes they might not even drink but get all the moisture they need from vegetation. The big cats on the other hand are a little bit different. They really do need to drink water and they, they, uh, they need water, they love water, they get really, really uh, dehydrated if uh, they don't get it but some animals can really adapt to that so great question Sabrina and I can't tell you my friend it's so great to have you on board so girls rock so we've got this bull here you can and if I had smell a vision for you folks I could uh, give you a little bit of a, a better description just by turning the smell of vision up but he smells fantastic he's got the elephants have got this really beautiful sweet smell about them and uh, he's also using his incredible ability uh, of his sense of smell as well you can see he's just lift raising his trunk there and uh, picking up whatever he possibly can he's a big old boy gotta be say say he's in his 40s probably by the look of his shoulder there and you can see just that that sort of indentation at the back of the skull on the front of the skull and the sink just the length of his his um tusks etc but it's always guesstimations with elephants you've got to be really around a lot of them and see them grow uh but again folks as i always say you know i come back as a guest here and um, any any information or little comments that you've got and you feel like tweeting in and letting us know that you can uh, you want to add I'll be more to more than happy to um, to share with everyone but he looks like he wants to come up here so I'm just going to give him a little bit of space maybe just to see what he does here he might just be turning around he's slightly in must now that's what I wanted to see can you see that little secretion coming out the side of his side of his temporal gland there that's a little secretion that occurs and is just telling us, well, it's, it starts to ooze like that when he is sexually active. So he's, the elephant's tolerance, I would say, is probably gets a little less of uh, us and other things. So we just give him a wide berth and really respect him. But you can see there's a great shadow there on his shoulder and you can see that just does show a little bit of the age of the animal. So with that other ear flopped over like it was, couldn't see um, whether he was in, in must, but uh, he is. So we'll just really give him a lot of space, and uh, as we always do, and the animals definitely uh, always come first.
We've got a nice uh, question from Kathy in Tennessee. Hi Kathy and welcome aboard. Great to have you with us. And uh, your question about when you were a child you used to go to the zoo and you distinctly remember different scents of the animals and how strong it was. Uh, and is it the same in the wild? Well, I'd have to say some animals have a much more pungent odour than others. Uh, elephant particularly. Um, you probably smell them uh, a little bit stronger in that close quarters in a, in a zoological institution than you do out here. But it depends where you are, Cathy, as well. Um, like, for example, you don't really smell impala or or kudu, really, unless you're probably up really, really close. Whereas at the moment, we're smelling the the sort of must gland of the elephant and also they have a tendency to urinate on and on their legs a little bit and there's a bit of a bit of sort of odor coming from them uh, more strongly than normal but yeah certain animals do have a, a certain smell about them and it depends where we're, we're positioned but I can guarantee you right now as Brian will uh, confirm <laughs> we've got a pretty good waft up here of uh, an elephant bull in must and it is, you know, it's it's kind of weird. Uh, some people might find it odd, but um, I really do think it's a fantastic smell. Look at him go. Look at him just motor up there. A lot of people don't don't think that elephants can climb that well. But, um, wow, when you see them just go up that hill like that, four-wheel drive, and uh, those massive shoulders pulling him up there. Oh, how beautiful. We've got a lovely question from Mia, and Mia's only four years old, or a big four years old, I should say, Mia. So great to have you on board, my friend, and how wonderful it is to be able to talk to you wherever you're watching right now. And your question's a really good one. I'm sure a lot of other people have been thinking of that as well. Mia, you want to know whether that elephant's ear might be sore. Well, you know what? I reckon it might be, but then again, it might not be as well. I think if it's been like that for some time, it probably just becomes like uh, a little bit numb or, you know, when you sit on your, your leg or something like that and you get pins and needles or something like that, it might be just feel a little bit like that for him. It looks like he, he doesn't look like he's in too much... Uh, pain or anything or he's not showing any abnormal behavior sometimes an animal like a an elephant who is incredibly intelligent as you know they've got that wonderful thing that that thing called that trunk down the front of his nose there which is an elongated or a lengthened nose and you can see he's using it for one of his very important things right now to spray water and mud over himself but um they have a tendency to rub an area if it's really sore. If they've got a thorn or a wound or something like that, they'll rub it with their um, with their trunk. So I haven't seen him do that, Mia. So in a short answer, which you know, HT, that's me, doesn't do very often, Mia. Um, I don't think he's in too much pain, my friend, but really, really great that you're caring about him and great to have you on board. Oh, got a great, great, uh, great question from Jerry in Australia. Jerry, welcome aboard. It's uh, it's about five to twelve at night, uh, mate. And thanks so much for sticking around and watching. And you you want to know um, what's my best elephant sighting? Well, I'm going to give you two really quick. Whilst we've got this beautiful beast in the background, um, there was an area way behind here one day where I pulled up with this elephant uh, and he wasn't in must so I just we just sat there and watched and Brian I think it was you and me actually remember when he fed underneath the front of the vehicle yeah and we watched this beautiful elephant walk up to us and you know you just get this sort of sense with them sometimes that uh, you know he's not showing aggressive behavior or anything like that and he came right up to the front of the vehicle and he started to feed underneath the vehicle. And he was a bull about the same size as this. So I have to say, you know, your heart rate rises and Brian and I were, you know, both talking about that later, but it was a magical experience that Brian and I uh, probably will never forget. I've got a great photograph of it. I'll, um, I'll try and put it up on, uh, 
on Facebook or something tonight, but um, it was a really great encounter. And then there was another one when we were out uh, doing a school drive for uh, some schools in Surrey in the United Kingdom uh, last year, and we were just about to close the show, and we were at uh, Bufflesook Dam, and this breeding herd of about 50 elephants came over as we were closing the show. So we carried on for another 10 or 15 minutes and watched them because it was just so brilliant. Uh, but they're two that I can really remember now. So great to have you on board, Jerry, in Australia, and fantastic uh, for watching Safari Live, mate. We uh, hope you continue. Look at that light. Isn't that beautiful? Sabrina's just also sent us another little comment, folks, and uh, I'm just going to share with you. Sabrina's done a, a, a wonderful project on giraffes recently uh, for school, which is fantastic. One of my un most favorite animals on the planet, Sabrina, and uh, you did it for school. And you're planning on visiting South Africa soon. Well, my friend, that would be super to have you here, that's for sure. Thank you so much. Folks, I'm just going to take a couple of photos, if that's okay, because this is just so beautiful, this light. And I do apologize for the clicking in the background, but I cannot tell you how beautiful that light is on that elephant. Oh, you can see it. <laughs> oh, gosh, he's beautiful. Well, just as this elephant starts to walk off, we're going to go to a man that walks as quiet as an elephant, has the brain size of an elephant, has the communication skills of an elephant, no other than James Hendry. We'll see you just now. You know what I mean? Hello everybody, we're back on walk now. Uh, we're going to head up towards the western side here. Herbert is in front of us. We just had to find him. That's why it took a little bit of time to get going. Uh, Viam is on camera. Hello, Viam. There we go. Viam's unusually large thumb would indicate to you that he's probably about seven feet tall. He isn't. He's about five foot eight, same as me. All right, let's go on a little bushwalk. For those of you who have never been on a bushwalk before, well, welcome to it. We're as live as Hayden is on the other vehicle. Um, you can talk to us, hashtag Safari Live, questions at wildearth.tv. Uh, my second walk of the day, Herbie as well. And there were some lion tracks apparently up to the north there. And so the idea is that we go and see if we can find where those lions went. I think Hayden will probably head towards those leopards eventually once Brent or Aubrey or Taxon find them. And that is the story of the afternoon. It's a glorious afternoon to be on foot. I'm not sad at all not to be in a car, to be honest, simply because there isn't a cloud in the sky. One should be strolling on a Sunday afternoon, really. And unfortunately, um, I've had to retrieve a new stick. And the new stick here is a function of the fact that I broke the old one this morning while losing my temper with a knob thorn that had attacked me. But this one will be very effective when... Um, you know, bopping someone on something or someone on the head. So if Liam doesn't behave correctly, we'll no, just again, bop yeah. him on the head. Um, if a lion was to come past, we'll just stop it in its tracks. That's basically that's a pretty good stick for that sort of thing. Now, Dave, you want to see some snakes. It's not great snake time, Dave, but um, we might be lucky. We could be lucky. Snakes at this time of the year that you'd look out for would probably be something like a puff adder, which would walk onto the road or come onto the road to absorb some of the heat once the sun has gone down. So that's a possibility. We could easily see a puff adder. I've got to tell you, I have not seen a lot in the way of snakes out here, though. That's not to say they aren't around. Their tracks are all over the place. And I saw a few snake tracks today, so maybe we'll see some tracks. But they will do my level best to find you some snakes. Now, this morning, I spoke quite extensively about the, um, about the creosote that had been put onto the trees in order to protect them. There's a tree up here. For those of you, while we get there, just to give you some background, um, if you look at around this area, if you look around quarantine clearings here, what you find is that it's like parkland. And parkland, we as human beings find very attractive because it is 
Oh, well, I'll go into the psychology of it just now. But if you have elephants coming across a clearing like this, what you find is that because the, it's been artificially cleared underneath the trees, only the big trees are here for them to eat. And they do this sort of thing. They will debark the tree and render it dead, as uh, Viam is showing you there. Now, if you don't want your trees to be rendered dead, then what you do is um, what Yuri and Mike Grover, who looks after this place, does. Come over here, Vim. It's over here. And this is an experiment that they've done. I didn't think it would work. It's a very simple kind of experiment. But if you look up here, you can see a little tin. And this little tin is filled with a substance called creosote which is filled with a, uh, well, it's a, it's a kind of organic substance. I think it's derived from oil, is it, Viam? No, I thought Viam would know this, but uh, well, I think it's an oil-derived substance. And the elephants apparently don't like the smell. And all over quarantine, there are trees with these little tins of creosote on them, and apparently the ele elephants have left them alone. This one, I think, was uh, probably damaged before the creosote was put onto it. So that's a really simple way of looking after the trees around here. And just one last look down through here and tell me, I'd, be loved, I'd really like to know in one word from all of you, well maybe not everybody, I mean a thousand words would be quite a lot, but maybe if, if you wouldn't mind sending through one word, tell me as Viam pans from right to left there, what that makes you feel with the tall trees and lots of space underneath them. And tell me just in one word, how that kind of scenery, that kind of vegetation type makes you feel. And then I'll tell you a little bit about it. And just by way of comparison, if you're struggling to come up with a word, just look through here, over there, where the bush is much thicker. There's still the same tall trees, but there's a lot more in the understory. And tell me how that makes you feel, how that compares you or changes the way you feel. And then we'll discuss it. Hashtag Safari Live questions at wildearth.tv. Come on, VMP, don't dally. Now, we're going to have a fireside chat this afternoon, a very short one, and we're going to talk to Hayden, obviously, around the fire, mainly about the schools program that he and the Taronga Zoo are doing. Please, if you want to ask any questions, um, ideally about the sort of subject we're going to talk about, but if you want to know what Hayden's doing, because, of course, since you last saw him, he's moved from Surrey in England. Uh, well, that's where he was working. He was living in Pimlico in London, and now he's living back in Sydney. So if you want to ask him a few things like that, because the fireside chat is short, it's only 15 minutes, it would be good if you would um, send through your questions now so that we can get a few lined up before we go towards the fireside chat. Okay, good. Rebecca, any words yet on the vegetation? Rebecca's gone radio silent. Oh, uh, none, not at the moment. Okay. <laughs> Zoe, you say beautiful. And Patrick, you're wondering how often we see big cats in the wild. You're from Holland and you're a new viewer. Lovely to hear from you. Thank you. Uh, we see big cats out here often, just about on a daily basis. Um, lions especially, leopards sometimes. And on foot, not as often because we don't cover the same amount of ground. But we do see cats on foot sometimes as well. Um, but almost on a daily basis. I'd see probably about... What would we say? About 80% of the drives, probably, we see a, a big cat, a lion or a leopard, sometimes cheetah. I know they're not cats, but we see hyenas as well. And I know they're definitely not cats. We see wild dogs as well, relatively regularly. So that's what those sort of frequency that we see the big cats. Here, careful, Vian, are some tracks. There we go, a buffalo track, everybody. Now, Jared, you said fresh. John, you said expansive and curious one. No, John, you said homesick. And I think uh, curious one, you said expansive. I think I've got that right. I may have got them all in the wrong order. Um, but here is the, this is just quickly, this is a buffalo track. And it's quite fresh. I think I walked across here this morning 
while we were on our morning walk. We did see them in the distance, and Jamie actually opened the show with them. And you can see some um, recalcitrant gwari bush that got stuck on the animal. Now, the difficulty with this kind of tracking a couple of hours ago, you can see how, because the sand is so perfectly crushed there. Okay. All right, we keep losing pictures, so we're going to stand up a bit. Um, now, that landscape that we were looking at is what you might describe as parkland. Now, parkland is it's the same reason that all of our parks are the same in cities, with trees and lots of understory. Apparently, it makes us feel happy. There's some impala through there, Vimpy. And this is exactly why it makes us feel happy. Can you see them? You got them there. Now, we can see them because there isn't a great big understory here. Now, in our human prehistory on the plains of East Africa and indeed Southern Africa, if you wanted to survive, you needed to get up into a tree when there was a threat. And when you were on the ground walking around, you needed to be able to see what was going to come and eat you. That is why, apparently, as what the evolutionary psychologists will tell you, this kind of area of parkland looks so attractive to us. In the thick bush, we start to feel uncomfortable because we can't see what's going on. And it's why a park, for example, um, in cities has big trees and lots of short grass underneath. I think that's quite interesting. Maybe it was obvious to you. It wasn't to me when I first read it. Herbert is just up ahead there. We're heading due west into the setting sun. And while we do that, so let's head across to Hayden, get an update from him, and find out what his plans are from now. James has always got so much fantastic information, particularly when you're on foot. Um, you know, he loves it. Getting out on there with that, the real small detail is uh, always a great thing on, on a walk. We just uh, left that elephant ball. He was so beautiful in that, that afternoon light there with all that mud on him. But I just want to show you these two little guys, two of my favorites. Uh, up here, I'll just turn off. We don't want to drive up too close because they're a bit skittish. And you can see these wonderful warthog here right now. A little antennae up at the back when they run there. That tail, uh, fantastic little adaptation there for them to be able to see each other through long vegetation. But um, they're a little bit skittish, the warthog around here. And sometimes you can go to places uh, in Africa where the, the warthog are very, very conditioned. Uh, but here, they have a tendency just to move away. Sometimes you'll get a, a, an encounter that's a bit closer. But um, I'm just getting Brian a little bit better shot there. I think I've just rolled up too far. Nice tusks on that boy there. Yeah, there we go. But yeah, you can see they're just on edge a little bit there. But beautiful creatures, absolutely fantastic. Diurnal creatures. I'm just going to carry on because we've got a little bit of a mission we're uh, going to go on here. Um, diurnal creatures, so that means that they are uh, operating during the day and they're sleeping during the night, normally in a burrow that they've uh, commandeered by, that was made by aardvark or hyena or anything for that matter. Um, termite mounds like we've got on the right here become incredible uh, homes to so many different species of animals. Not only termites under there uh, who, have d who have built that incredible structure, but you'll find aardvark will dig uh, into those and then once the aardvark abandons it you might get warthog move in and um, <coughs> have a series, excuse me, or a, uh, a, an area where they'll have different burrows that they sleep in or they use for safety. And then um, you might get a den of a hyena denning there. Uh, you might have even seen wild dog. I've even seen a, a leopard come out of a, a warthog uh, or a aardvark. Uh, we're going to go down here, hole, and uh, so lots of different animals. And I've also seen mumbas come out of them as well. So not a great place to stand in front of a warthog hole if ever you're in the bush. Uh, always go to the side of the warthog hole and have a look down. Don't stand in front of it because if a warthog does come barreling out, Yes, you will uh, know about it. So what we're going to do go down here is there was a very special creature found here this morning. And Brian is steering me through this because I wasn't here this morning. Uh, a very special creature indeed. 
a leopard s that I have to say that I am madly in love with. It is the Karula we are talking about, the Karula, the queen of Juma. Uh, and she was down here and she made a kill and it was in a very inaccessible spot. Look at these lovely little guys. Sorry, before I move on. We always need to stop. Um, I'm just going to just turn off. That's really cool. They're youngsters. Look at those beautiful, beautiful water buck. They're only youngsters and they're really woolly, aren't they? I always think that, you know, we've got to be careful we don't give just a cursory glance to these incredible hoofed animals that we've got here and uh, stop and look at every one. Even the wonderful and incredibly populated impala, we need to make sure that we stop and enjoy every single creature. Uh, at the moment we're just looking at white rings on bottoms there. So we might move around a little bit. They might trot off because they're only youngsters and they might not have the confidence up at the moment. There's a little, there's a zebra, there's an impala there and a zebra off a little bit further on. All looking for, a bit hard there, Bryce, sorry mate. Just Well, look, we just got a little request here uh, from Emily in Durban to find you a zebra today. Well, Emily, I think we can do that. Brian, let me just crack back a little bit for you. Just tell me when you can see that little zebra face there, mate. Yep. Emily, there you go, my friend. There's a little zebra through there. See, peeking through there is a zebra. It's the plain zebra or the birchal zebra, we, we, the common, more common of the zebras, but, you know, we don't use the word common in a, in a way that uh, is definitely not uh, uh, a word that I'm using lightly there. It's just common because they're the most abundant zebra, um, but they're so fantastic. And these are the ones that have got the shadow stripe. Now, I was just over in Namibia and I saw this amazing zebra uh, subspecies there called... Uh, a Hartman's Mountain Zebra, and they don't have the little shadow stripe that these ones do, and they've got really st tight stripes close together. So there's lots of different ones, and right up in Kenya, you've also got another zebra called a Grevy Zebra, which have uh, got very super tight stripes. But this is our Plains or Birchall Zebra that we've got here. And Emily, go on, give me another animal to find. What do you think? There you go. Thanks for watching, Emily. Great to have you on board. So we've also got um, a school in Namibia, or a friend of mine's got a, a, a camp over there, and uh, she's got some kids with her at the moment that are watching. I think they may have just finished watching and they've gone out on game drive, but they might have caught a little bit of it before we had those hiccups uh, earlier. But isn't it great that kids can be watching, and adults are like, of course, all you adults that are watching now that watch religiously, we, as I said, always, we couldn't do it without you. But isn't it great to know that kids can have this experience, particularly in rural and remote areas that might not get the chance to come on safari, might not get a chance to even travel out of their country, or for that matter, and I have to say this with great care and love uh, for children, you know, might not be able to, they might not be well, they might, you know, there might be something else going on in their world. So if we can give them a little escape or a little adventure, and an unforgettable experience. That's the most important thing because we need to flick that love nature switch in every little kid when we can. As soon as we can do it, think about when you did it. I'm going to ask a question now to you guys on Twitter and we'll, we'll try and randomly pick out some, uh, some comments. But tell us in a tweet, when was the time, in a very short tweet, obviously, uh, when was the time that your love nature switch was flicked in your life? Was it with your mum or your dad when you were in the woods or you were going off, you saw a bear or, you know, with me, I, I'm going to share this with you, I blame it on the humble chicken. Um, my dad bought me four chickens when I was about five and that was it. My love nature switch or love animal switch was flicked in my, in my soul. So tweet us and tell us what, what your love nature moment was or when it happened to you because we've all had one we've all had one and uh it might be a vivid memory that you have so just give us a tweet or an email and uh tell us uh what that was so brian where do you think we should go okay gonna go around
Sorry, Control, can you just uh, repeat that lady's name, please? Thank you. S sorry, it's a man, so I do apologize. Um, I didn't know, I thought it was Claire. But Blair, male Blair, thank you very much, I do apologize, uh, in Canada has asked if I've bought my lucky porcupine quill. For people who don't know about the porcupine quill, it was just a bit of fun. I found this porcupine quill one day and I just randomly uh, gave it a rub and said this is our lucky porcupine quill. Well, that 2014 Safari Live Big Cat Week that we did was just out of control. It was epic, the animals that we saw and the things that happened. So we sort of kept this porcupine quill going and um, I have got it with me and I've just got to tell you that I haven't got it with me right now but it is in my backpack and uh, after the scrambling around this afternoon uh, and changing vehicles um, it obviously wasn't bringing me much luck earlier in Rusty but uh, <coughs> I do have it with me Blair just a bit of fun there but thanks for watching Blair and great to have you on board in Canada wow there's some interesting elephant uh, impact on this this bushland that I'm seeing right in front of us now um, you heard James talking about the uh, the measures that we're taking up on quarantine uh, up on that area to stop elephants pushing over the trees I'm, I'm really noticing it here uh, excuse me please um, that being said you know these things happen naturally and uh, when a, a severe sort of dry spell like we're in right now it can have a, a great impact on the all the animals in the habitat but elephants will then be going for the higher more tastier treats if there is any up there and pushing these trees over to get the, the tender shoots or leaves that are left on the top or sweeter bark so um, I'm really noticing uh, a lot of these a lot of these trees being pushed right over So James, Richard, how are you, mate? Great to have you on board, uh, and great to be back, and thank you very much for, for messaging in. Um, James, you want to know how I'm feeling to be back at Juma? Ecstatic, elated. Uh, I can't contain my excitement, but I have to, to uh, look professional and all that sort of thing. Um, but inside, there's a small kid jumping up and down, just sitting in this car, living my dream living my absolute dream from when I was a kid. So, yeah, I'm a little bit excited to be back. Um, what is my thoughts, your second part of your question, what's my thought about the landscape and the drought and uh, the conditions of the animals, etc.? Well, look, it's a, there is a sort of classic dry spell at this time of the year, no matter what. The bush in Africa at this time of the year, in where we are, it does get dry. It's middle of winter, there's very low rainfall, and... Uh, it does get like this, but it's also, it has been elongated at the ends with very, very low rainfall up until the winter, so it's had a huge, a, a greater impact is probably the best way. Brian, which way do you think, mate? I do apologise, James, just to stand by for me on the question. Brian's just uh, trying to remember where we... we oh, you're just thinking of having a guess, okay. Brian's just using his, um, his intuition here to see if we can pick up even tracks of Karula crossing the road. So James, if I don't tour into camera and speak to you uh, personally there, know that I am just looking ahead for, for any tracks or Karula as well. So James, yeah, the, the condition of the, the uh, habitat is very, very dry. Uh, I do think that, you know, there's permanent water here, okay? So that's, you're always gonna have animals here, but um, the impact on those animals is probably going to be seen uh, if this continues uh, because if all the plains animals or the the we're going to just turn around and go up this road here all a lot of the hoofed animals and the the food for the large carnivores disappears either the carnivores will end up leaving as well or sometimes it can go the other way you'll always get uh you'll always get um, animals that are pressured to stay in the area and sometimes the carnivores can benefit from that I'm just um, slowly approaching up here because there's a vehicle and I'm not sure uh, if it is Karula that they've found. 
but let me just uh, slowly edge my way up here and see if we can make a plan. I'm just trying to see if it's what... While we're doing this, and I just might find to get out a bit of uh, information from the guys up here, let's cross over to James and see what he's up to you, and I will come back to you just now. It's great to be here, folks. Now, we've come up the road, everybody. We've found a fallen marula tree, which is not precisely what I wanted to show you, but Viam is feeling artistic this afternoon, so he thought he'd just show you this uh, marula tree. Now, over there, you can see Herbert. Herbert is currently now following tracks of the Nguhuma Pride. We found the tracks on the road. We're not sure if they are, how fresh they are because the, the ground is quite difficult to see on. There are tracks of the cubs as well. We think they may have gone down there, but they may have just used, they were chasing some buffalo here. They may have chased them for a while and come back, possibly yesterday. So we're just going to follow through here. So while Herbie's trying to discern what's going on, we'll discover what else we can around here. The first thing I want to show you is whether or not this is a male or female marula tree. Now, it's important this, well, it's, I suppose it's important, but it's quite interesting. This, I would imagine, is a male tree, and I'm going to confirm that by looking to see if I can see any pips on the ground. I cannot see any pips on the ground, so I'm going to confirm that it's male. And that's because if you look at these ends, they don't branch very much the ends of the leaves. Now obviously the females branch a lot more because they have to bear all the fruit. So they branch probably three or four more times than these ones do and that's where the fruit comes from and it obviously gets dropped on the ground and we'll try and find you a female one. But I suspect quite strongly and I don't know this for sure that elephants ring bark and push over male marula trees far more than they do the females because they know the females produce fruits they don't obviously, well, I mean, we don't know this for sure, but we're pretty sure that they don't know what tree is female and what tree is male. But what they do know is which trees produce fruit and which do not, and that comes entirely from their memory. So I think that's quite interesting. If you want to have a son, you're a newly married couple, or perhaps you're not that newly married, but you'd like to produce a son, what you do is you take the bark of that marula tree, you cut a little bit of it off, you soak it in some water, and you give it to your wife, and she will then bear you a son. Uh, if you want a daughter, uh, if you're brave enough to have a daughter, then what you will do is take the female tree, uh, the bark of that, make a tea of that, and drink it. Don't know if it works or not. I suppose it's probably got about a 50-50 chance of uh, working properly. Herbie says the tracks have turned around. He's coming back toward... No, he's not. He's saying, let's go this way. Okay, let's see what Herbert's got to say about these lion tracks over here. We'll walk slowly through. We don't want to get Viam stuck in a bush. Even though he is five foot eight, his, uh, his aerial is uh, far larger than five foot eight. So come gently through here. We don't think these tracks are that fresh, so we don't need to be too quiet at this stage. If we look like, or if it feels like they're going to be fresh, you'll notice my voice drops immediately. And you can feel it. You can feel it when tracks are fresh and you're on them and you've been concentrating. You can feel when they start to, it feels like the lions are close. And you tell dog to talk like this and shake your ash bag very often to see which way the wind's blowing. Right, Herbie. Hunting here. Very nice. Okay. Okay, we'll just keep checking. All right, I'll tell you what Herbert said here. So here's the female's track. Here. You can see it there. That's her track there. The three back pads and the four front pads. And here, she's being followed by her youngster. Three, four, and the three back pads. Herbie's still not convinced that, this, that they are moving in this direction, he, well they're obviously moving here, but he's not, con not convinced that they're headed that, this, this direction other than to try and follow um, an animal or two on the hunt. So what he's doing is he's circling around to see if there aren't others that come back this way, because we did find a patch there where they were lying. It's difficult to tell, especially because they were moving, whether that lion track is fresher than the ones where they were lying. 
Let's continue through here. Nice lion tracking country this, because it's open. And that means you're unlikely to stand on a lion's tail before you've seen it. That is important when you're tracking lions, because lions don't like having their tails stood on. Do that, Vim. Not at all, correct. Yeah, Herbie thinks it's still going down this way. Now, Crad from Romania, this is your second question. It's wonderful to have you back with us. Thank you for sending us a question. Crad, everybody, is all the way from uh, Romania. You say you've noticed that Herbert has got a rifle. He does have a rifle. We're going to go down this way so that VM doesn't get mangled. Um, and you say it's for protection. And do the vehicles um, carry a rifle as well to protect them from perhaps lions? Uh, Crad, they don't. And the reason that Herbie's carrying a rifle is that if you're guiding in a, what we call a high-profile game area here in South Africa, it's a legal requirement that you carry a weapon. We don't, uh, well, it's not a legal requirement, it's a legal requirement in so much as were there to be an accident, there's another track there, were there to be an accident, you obviously want to make sure that you've got as much protection as possible, but you'll find that Herbert has never fired a weapon in anger. So the chances of him ever happening to use it or having to use it are extremely small. On the vehicle, the animals do not perceive us in the same way as they do out here on foot. On foot they perceive us as much more of a threat and obviously you can't just drive away from something. If it comes at you, you have to stand your ground and then the rifle does help a bit. But on the vehicles it's simply not necessary. Now, Herbie's saying they lay down over here. So if we look here, oh look, you can see here, well, I'm just going to ask VM to pan around here, you can see the ground is a little bit flattened, you can see here where, where they got up, and all I'm showing you there is their feet as they've slipped, as they've kind of got up like that, did you see that VM? Got up like that, feet have slipped and they've started to move again. Let's keep following, Herbert is right on the tracks. I don't think these are particularly fresh, but of course we know that lions do very little during the course of the day, and so we may come across them at any stage. In the meantime, here is a piece of dung. Now, I don't know what kind of dung that is, but I suspect, Dave, that this is a snake's dung. I know it's either a reptile or a bird, because the cloacal opening, the opening from which they must defecate and urinate, is the same, one and the same. So what happens is that the feces comes out there, and then the uric acid in the urine produces that um, white tip to the top of the feces. And I, this is quite long, it's quite solid, so I don't think it's a bird. It could be a monitor lizard, I suppose. A very large tree or rock monitor could have put it down here. But I wonder if a snake hasn't come through here and dropped it at some stage. It's not very fresh during the last few days, possibly during the midday when it was hot enough uh, before they went back down into their holes. Uh, because in the winter, of course, they're not particularly active. Very nice. Let's continue. Herbie's just over there. Big termite mound. And the lions have walked past that. Now, I'm sure there must be some of you thinking to yourselves, um, uh, you know, hunting lions, or we're not hunting them, obviously, we're tracking them, but that must be a fairly dangerous activity. Well, I mean, the risk is, is there. We know that these lions have got cubs, and so there is an element of risk involved in it. But, you know, as long as we are careful, if we find them, the females will growl. If we move away, then they'll leave us alone. And, I mean, the idea would be to try and view them, say, from a vantage point like that termite mound or, you know, bet with a clearing between us and them. And then we'd call the vehicles in and they would get a much closer look. That's quite interesting. You can see here this elephant dung. But in the middle of it, a diker has obviously gone to the loo and it's so close 
interesting. Looks like an impala. It's so um, closely packed that I suspect this impala was lying here, comforted by the softness of the elephant down, down on the ground. I suppose it must, you know, if you don't have a feather bed, well, elephant dung is not a bad thing to lie in amongst. Now, Hayden was telling you about holes in termite mounds, so come and have a look here. And when you approach the hole in a termite mound, I know this one isn't inhabited, but what you do is normally come up to it from the side like this, and then you'll look to see if there's any fresh activity. You might... Is that your belly or an elephant? Elephant's calling from quite a long way to the south of us. Um, then you'll give it a little tap to see if anyone's home. The warthog sticks its head out, then you'll just stand here like this and let it go out. But otherwise, you can walk around the front and have a look. Now, if you come over here, VMP, you can see this has definitely been dug by an artfark or ant bear. It's a very large hole there. They've gone into it, but it's also been re-excavated, and I think probably by warthogs that have lived in there and stuck their heads in there. They've, warthogs have a number of temporary burrows around where they live, so that would have been one of the things. Lion track's still going this way. Herbie's just waved at me from through the thickets. I've got to tell you, it's something of an honor going for a walk with a man like this because he sees things that I just don't. We were walking just now before you came to join us. He was going, see, see the track there? And that's where it was chasing the buffalo. And that's where the cub turned around and came back. And that's where it lay down. I don't know what on earth he was talking about. Now, I've been in this area for some time, and still that level of skill absolutely astounds me. I haven't seen any f tracks for a while. Did you see one? A couple of them. Lynn, you want to see, know if we ever see owls? Is that right, Rebecca? Owls? We do see owls, many. Owl pellets. Oh, owl pellets, yes. Sometimes, owl pellets, everybody, if you don't know, um, are something um, like a, um, an animal like a, or an owl like a barn owl will eat a, a, a rodent hole. They don't pick them apart like a, a giant eagle owl does. They'll swallow the rodent hole, and then the digestive system is so clever that what it does is basically produce a dry pellet of fur and bones, and then they spit it out. We do find them. Barn owls not that common around here. And I think not all the owl species uh, produce them. I think maybe the white face does. I've certainly seen a pearl-spotted owl picking apart a carcass. They're not swallowing them whole. And so they probably don't produce the pellets in the same way. Incredible sighting we had yesterday of two white-faced owls. And a viewer sent me an amazing video of a white-faced owl that's been in a sort of a bird rehab center. Because the two of them, I don't know if you were watching yesterday afternoon, but we had the perfect kind of a picture book white-faced owl, and then another one that looked like it had been squashed flat and with its ears up, and it looked like a totally different species. Now, this video that I was sent shows you how those owls morph entirely when they're faced with a threat. So I think they're probably threatened by us, and they sort of go, they look, slightly taller, they go all thinner, their ears come up, and they look a bit more like, I suppose, a vicious eagle owl. Very funny to watch. Just going to get an update from Herbie up here. All right there, VMP. This is the ideal way to be tracking lions on bushwalk. You don't want to be talking, looking into the camera, then at the odd piece of track and that sort of thing. Herbert on point is ideal. <laughs> We've had a little look at some reptile dung with me. I believe Hayden is following the Sunday dung theme and he has some further dung on his dash. So, you know, James and I like our like our poo. Um, you can tell a lot from an animal's poo. 
you as a zookeeper when I was, it could tell you if your animal was in good condition, if it had eaten something uh, that wasn't uh, uh, good for it, and there's lots of other things. So, you know, animal feces are in our world, and we do use it as a sign that an animal's been here as well, so there's loads of different things. But on a serious note, uh, and it's really interesting because a lot of the time you go through the bush and you might not see the animal, but you've got tracks and signs. And that's part of the bush newspaper. It's part of uh, looking at all the looking at the big picture and putting it all together. And I just wanted to show you as we started off. James was talking about digestion. You can have a look here at this um, this elephant uh, dung on the right. And look, these are still undigested sticks in here. The light uh, is getting a bit low there for Brian. I've got to try and keep it still for him. But you can see how fibrous that. Uh, that elephant dung is here, but now if we go down to this impala dung, this here is absolutely incredible, incredibly efficient digested material. If I break that open, I'll just cut it open uh, here with a little, with my little dissection kit, and I've got to get some light on that for Brian. Sorry, you can have a look there. It's as close as we can get, guys. But what that is, I might be able to sprinkle it and give a little bit more of an idea from the dust that comes out of it. Here we go, look at that. Look at that. That is finely chewed up, ruminated, look, it's flying away just like dust there, vegetation of an impala. Now, what the animal has done has chewed it up, it's gone into its first of its stomachs, and it's come back up as rumen, uh, and it's been regurgitated and then you might have seen, you know, driving along in a countryside wherever you live and you're watching in the world, you might have seen a cow standing on the side of the road, chewing like that. That's my impersonation of a cow ruminating. Uh, you may have seen that and it is the cow chewing over and getting the most out of it. And then what happens through a process of going through this several chambered or four ta chambered stomach, it processes really indigestible plant matter called cellulose down into a digestible carbohydrate, which is energy for the animal, through a process of fermentation. So the elephant has got a very, very inefficient, so to compensate for that, it has to consume vast amounts, which is why we're seeing all this, this sort of, let's not call it damage, but impact on the habitat. Um, whereas these little guys have an incredible ability to consume and efficiently use the same plant cellulose, but look what comes out. So there lies the sermon, the end of the poo story from James and I. We will uh, get rid of that for the minute. I normally put them on the bonnet, but they end up staying there for the whole drive, which can be quite annoying. Um, we'll make sure that that doesn't go into anyone's dinner tonight. Right, so we move on and we have a look. So this is an area that Karula was seen in, Brian tells me earlier uh, this morning, and he's not sure either, so we're just sort of looking and looking and looking at the moment. Um, Brent uh, Leo Smith, well, known also to me uh, as I like to call him the bloodhound when it comes to uh, leopard, um, has also told us that it was around this area. So let's just keep our eyes open and see what happens. You never know what's around the next corner. Now, do you know what? I'm just going to tell you something really weird where that came out just now. Uh, when that saying that I, some people may know me uh, for saying you never know what's around the next corner, and the reason I say that is because right on this moment, this point just here, I said that on the other side of the road, and I came around the corner, and there was Blondie from the Birmingham Boys, the only male that I hadn't seen on the day, sitting in the middle of the road, and that's why... It is a true fact, folks. You never know what's around the next corner. And I love that about the bush, and I love that about the adventure. And I love that about having you guys with me, the anticipation of wherever you are sitting in the world at the moment, joined in on this fantastic live drive um, that we, we do every day, or this ma magical team of Safari Live people. Um, you're with us, and the anticipation is great. He was just here. So let's keep our eyes out for this beautiful girl. Lauren from Melbourne. Hello. Melbourne, Australia. Lauren, so great to have you on board. You're a new viewer. Well, for new viewers, I stopped the car. 
I salute you. Thank you very much for being with us. And you're saying that it's worth staying up for till two o'clock in the morning in Australia. Well, that's so great to hear, Lauren. And uh, hopefully we've got you hooked and you've become a soldier in our army. Welcome, Lauren. Great to have you on board. Let's find ourselves a leopard. Not just any leopard, but the queen. Now, the, the story went that she killed an impala, and Brent said it was in an incredibly inaccessible area, but that doesn't mean that it's that still there. She might have dragged it, she might have put it up a tree, but I think she wouldn't have probably put it up the tree straight away, because I think the story went that she it looked like she went off to get her cubs. And I haven't seen the cubs yet. So, wow. Well. Okay, we've got a, a message uh, from, I think it's Dispatch. Uh, I think that's correct, Control. Dispatch is your, your handle or your call sign. You would like to know what my most memorable <laughs> experience in the bush. Oh my goodness me. Do you know what? It's too hard to answer the, just one because there's so many memorable ones. But you know, I've been on drives with Brian and Viam and, and Chris as well. <laughs> Hi. And uh, Hi guys, sorry about that. And I've had incredibly memorable experiences. We stop and say hi? Yeah, why not? This is the, uh, the one and only Brent Leo Smith and Mr. Wallington and your team. Hello Em, hi everyone. We're having a lovely, we saw some lovely Ellie's just down below uh, the camp this morning. We're just looking, we're just talking about you actually and maybe you can help. Where did you, um, See Karula last. Uh huh. And then cross over the dam wall, and then head straight to the east. Uh, you'll see all the vehicle tracks. She's out like in the open now. You might be able to get a better spot with the camera than we could get okay. this long car. Okay. How many people there? Just one. Just one. <laughs> <sighs> Folks, I love it when a plan comes together. You never know what's around the next corner. Where hey? Oh. Any gear? How do you do those? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. Isn't that magic? How fantastic is that? <laughs> we just bump into Brent. I was saying Brent was telling us this, Brent was telling us that. You never know what's around the next corner. And it might not be an animal, but it might be intelligence from people that know. And uh, many of you would know that was Graham Wallington and his, and his wife Emily, the, you know, the, the foundation of Safari Live, those guys there on uh, it's Emily's. Uh, birthday so I wish her a fantastic happy birthday um, treehouse can we go down that way Bri I folks I just have to remember my roads uh, I go straight yeah straight treehouse was it yeah. yeah we'll go left it okay gotcha sorry folks I just have to get myself orientated again um, and make sure I'm not uh, going the wrong way so I think there is news it could have been that road actually Bri couldn't it yeah. I think it was. Yep. This is what happens. This is what we do. It's all all fine. We always make a plan. Um, and we will go down and see if we can find this beautiful girl. Um, now, Karula, you, many of you viewers are going to know a lot more about Karula than I do. Many of you have known her since she was born. And um, I've just had a... a several encounters with her that I've never forgotten, uh, sightings that just blow your mind because she's this incredible, incredible mother. She's got an incredible history. Um, yeah, and she's known as, as the Queen of Juma and, and Juma the gave it private game reserve we're on right now. And uh, I just, I just love this cat. Her son is my other favorite and his name is Mr. Q. Um, but I don't think I'm going to see him this week because he's actually on a few other properties. But he is sort of loitering around. But uh, he's, he's, uh, he was the first leopard I saw on, on, uh, this, on Juma in 2014. But Karula, 
who we're going to hopefully see soon, if we are lucky and we're heading the right direction. Uh, just, uh, I just love leopards. We all love leopards. They are such an incredible cat. Um, but we, uh, we do know intimate details about these leopards on, on uh, Juma and on Safari Live, and many of you watching have helped us with that. I often rely on you all to help me if I've spotted a leopard that I'm not sure of who it is, and I, I really only sort of can really pick out Mvula, Karula, and Quarantine are my sort of three that I can remember. But you know, the Anderson male, Tingana, um, and, and many others, uh, Sindile, well, I'd be able to recognize Sindile at the moment, but many of these leopards, and for you first time uh, viewers and Safari Live people that have just come on board for the first few times, we get to know our animals intimately here and their stories, and the stories are so, so hugely important because, you know, we can sit here and bombard or tell you fact after fact after fact, but it's what connects us with these animals and the stories behind them. and. Research has shown, and I'm telling you this without a lie, a very good friend of mine, my director at uh, the zoo that I work at, Paul Maguire, told me about this paper that he read recently. People, research has shown that people connect with the story. They connect with the story, they remember the story. And I just love that. So. <laughs> Chris Rogue, how are you, buddy? Good to have you on board. Chris has just tweeted in and she said her love nature switch was triggered by a television program in the United States that went right across the world, which I used to watch as a kid, Chris, as well. Brian, which way do you reckon? Okay. And then east. Sorry, Chris, I'm coming to you right now. Um... Chris, you're saying you blame your love nature switch being flicked because of the program Wild Kingdom. Well, I tell you, Chris, I have to say I hugely agree on that. On a television program, well before I was watching Attenborough or anything like that or any of the you know, interesting sort of documentaries on, on Nat Geo or anything like that, I was watching Wild Kingdom as a kid. Wow. Guys, whilst I do this, we're going to cross to James. He's gone from uh, dung to something very, very special. I'll see you just now. We found the lions, everybody. Herbert found the lions. There they are. There, 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 there. There's a lioness moving. Did you see it? Did you see it there, Vimpy? We don't know if you saw it, everybody. So you'll have to let us know. We're going to wait here. There's a big thicket in there. They've got the youngsters. We're not going to go anywhere. There, there, there. There's another one. We heard some impala alarm calling. Did you see them there, Vimpy? Rebecca, did you see them? There, another one. More of them moving. This is so exciting, everyone. This is just the most fantastic thing. Now, because there are some little ones in there, we're not going to go any closer. We'll try and get one last look by moving parallel with them. And then we're going to call the vehicles in. This is just brilliant. <laughs> this is too fantastic for words. It's so awesome. I'd love to. I mean, that's very nice of Herbert to be congratulating me. It's entirely him. That is just, just brilliant. We'll just try and get one last look. Like I say, because they're in some thick bush there, we're not going to go any closer because it's quite possible that the female will come herring out at us and that, Herbert says, we'll start to dance then. So Herbie's going to call it in on the radio. Now, it's very important at this stage that we don't behave like predators. We must behave completely like we've seen them, like we are dominant and like we are not stalking them. Now, now the bush is getting thick. Him. Okay, let's go a little bit closer. So 
we'll bring the vehicles in now, everyone. We'll see if we can get one more view. A few more steps. I'm sure they've moved off into some thicker bush. Because they're aware of us, they will keep moving. And just keep... Okay. Um, <laughs> just... Um, Excuse my not looking at you. I've got to keep looking in the bush here. I'm just going to let Herbert assess quickly. Okay, they are coming in the vehicle. We're just going to try. We'll walk parallel with them. They were in this thicket here. What we don't want to do is make them feel harassed. I think. We're going to, this is very thick in here, we're going to move all the way around here. As soon as we can get a vehicle in here, obviously they will have a look much better view than we will. Here comes a vehicle now. still in here. There's some impala over there, so we're probably going to move around here. Some impala through where Herbert was looking. <whistles> Alright, I think while we try and sort things out here, I think that's the best view we're going to get. Just brilliant stuff. Let's go back across to Hayden. He's got another cat for you. A brilliant Sunday cat festival. Let's go and have a look. Well, my friends, I tell you what, I can't tell you how exciting this is. It's all right, baby. It's all right, baby. It's okay. It's okay. There's Karula just down there, and there's her little, little cub. I can only see one at the moment. Oh, she is so beautiful. This is just brilliant. What an absolutely superb way to finish the week. Sunday, sensational Sunday. So the little cub is just laid down out of our vision, but Karul is just there. Um, I just want them to get used to us a little bit, folks. Just uh, Obviously, I'm not in the most fantastic position for Brian with that, um, that tree right in the way here, but I just pulled in here and let's just um, let them get sorted out and we're just getting used to us because the little cubs are also a little uh, just not temperamental but okay sorry my um, cap just getting into shot there a little bit folks I do apologize but look at her, she's just down there in that lovely little cool spot. Nice breeze flowing. Aha, look what's just come up behind her. Oh, how special is this? The other cub. Phew. <laughs> That's good to see. Both of them. A male and a female. And how beautiful. Hello, my friends. And hello, you old friend. Isn't she spectacular? Look, just the way she even sits and looks. I mean, a leopard to me is the absolute epitome of beauty, strength, and stealth. It's like embodied in this cat. And I just love, love leopards. You cannot just get tired of looking at them. 
well. So what I'm going to do is obviously they know we're here. I'm going to try and get Brian in a little bit, a bit better position. He's got these two trees right in the middle of the frame from my fantastic uh, arrival here. Brian, I might just move over to the right a little bit, mate. Is that better for you? It's okay, my friends. It's okay, guys. There we go. We didn't even see a movement there. So that's how conditioned or habituated uh, the leopards are to our vehicle. So let me just move back a little bit. Just want to try and get Brian in the V of that tree. So he's got some beautiful, a beautiful shot for you. It's all right, my darling. It's okay. I'm not going to come too close because I know you've got your babies. How's that, Brian? Is that a bit better? Yeah, that looks a bit better. So if we focus on, on her, we've got more chance of um, the babies coming up to her to show a little bit of um, interaction, of maternal interaction. And uh, if we follow the little, the little cubbies, they're probably going to run around. They're just cleaning themselves. So it looks like they've just had a feed down below in that little, uh, little gully or little dry creek bed or what we call a drainage line just below us. So we're on quite a steep angle here and uh, they're completely relaxed. They're cleaning the little cub is cleaning himself down there, um, just like a domestic cat would. You'll see your cat after it's eaten at home if you own a cat. Um, very, very particular about their cleanliness, cats, and uh, they do that characteristic licking their paw and pouring their face, cleaning their face after they've eaten. So that's great news that she's taken an impala, she stashed it. She then uh, went back and got the cubs. Look at that. So she's just moving down now. She may go down and have a feed herself. Uh, and we've got that little guy just there. It's not the most fantastic of spots that I'm in at the moment, but I just want to get them used to us before we, I can reposition. Hmm. They're in a very playful mood. Um, right, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to try and just get down over here to our right. And I can see if I can see down that. I can see Karula just down below me here. Brian, if you can just see there a little bit of her back. Okay, so that must be where the kill is. Uh, and she's keeping out a wary eye out for anyone at the moment. Um, the cubs are just playing off behind here. I'm going to try and manoeuvre down here and just get a little bit of a sighting of her. It's okay my girl. Good to see you. That's for sure. Isn't this fantastic? Karula, James with cats, big cats, lions on foot. This is Safari Live. If you love Africa and you love safaris and you love it live, you're in the right place. You're in the right place. I'm going to have to do a very tricky maneuver here. Um, just let me see if I can get a little visual on her down here. Oh yeah, that's that's sort of okay, Bri. What's that like for you? Can you? We can see her. It's not great. She's in a really tricky position here, folks. Um, she's feeding down there. She's got a back to us. She's trying. You see what she's doing now? She's scraping some some uh, leaf litter and dirt over the kill because she wants to leave this kill on the ground for the for the cubs to feed on. So it's a very different behavior that she's doing here. Instead of putting it up a tree and caching it up the tree, she's uh, she's doing this characteristic pouring and covering. Um, that's really great, great behavior to see. As I said, folks, it's not the most incredible position we're in, but uh, we do have Corolla and Cubs, so that's all that matters. Uh, how exciting, how exciting is that to see Corolla? My goodness, I've missed her. I'm just gonna just turn around again and see if I can get into a better position for you, Brian. I think, is that any better there, mate? 
At least we can see the behaviour. It's not a clear shot, that's for sure, but at least we can see the behaviour, and that's really, really important. Um, so she's also keeping a keen ear open for her cubs, and the cubs are getting older. Um, I just have to remind you, might, someone might be able to tweet in and remind me how old these cubs are. Um, if you can help me out there, that would be fantastic, and I can share that with the viewers. Uh, but that would be great to know. But two cubs still, and an incredible mother with, uh, with great experience, and she's raised many a cub. So you can just hear another vehicle pulling up, folks, um, and just uh, coming to share the sighting and see this magical, magical cat. So we've just got her down there. I might, Brian, just reposition over here and let these guys in to uh, have a little look. I'm going to just reverse up, guys, and you can pull in here and I'll go the other side, okay? We've got a great question from Paul, and Paul wants to know, does Karula look any different from the last time I saw her? More beautiful, more fan more wonderful, maybe? No, I can't tell. Uh, Paul, I have to be completely honest with you. I can't remember what her condition was like last time I saw her. Um, but it's OK, my girl. It's OK, darling. So just gently ease ourselves in here, because we can, because we have this fantastic vehicle. I don't know, Brian, whether this is going to be any better for you, but I'm doing my best here to try and... Okay, let's link over to James while I try and reposition and see what he's up to. We'll be with you just now. Did you see that, Bex? I think you got them. Um, we just, we were kind of leaving this area and we saw some warthogs running and a lion burst out of the bush from where she was. And I'm just going to show you where they are. You can see Aubrey's vehicle there. We were just kind of sneaking out of the area. Some warthogs came running past. She saw them and she shot out from where you're looking now. And we heard of a great ruckus down in the drainage. And Herbert reckons the big bull, boar that was behind them turned and probably gave her a bit of a charge. And then the rest of them ran off. And she's gone back to join the others. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> Brilliant stuff. Just a quick link here. We're probably going to keep making our way out of here, so if possible, we're going to link you back to Hayden. Is that okay? Oh, yes. there, another one, another lion. Don't go to Hayden just yet. Oh, this is just too wonderful. <laughs> no, I can't see her now. Let's just, yeah, come this way, Limpy. Step to your right. To the left of Aubrey there. You might be able to see them. Just understand, everybody, this, for VM, is extremely difficult because he's looking through a tiny little viewfinder. He's not able to kind of get a wide view like we are able to. It's a bronze wing Corsa. Uh, I don't think we can see them anymore. Yeah, that was just fantastic. Okay, let's go back to let's go back to Hayden and the leopard. If we get another view, we'll come quickly across. But I think we're slowly going to make our way towards quarantine. Wonderful stuff. Well, my friends. This is absolutely incredible. She's just climbed up a tree right in front of us. And she's just plonked herself, I would tell you, five metres away from us, 15 feet in this tree. She's actually at the same height as our heads at the moment. Brian's probably looking straight into her eyes. She's looking down at her cubs at the moment, who I can see, but it's very, very difficult for me to explain where they are. They're down in some thick vegetation. She's watching them with a very, very close eye, but she has just gone up there 
Oh my goodness, how good is that? So Wendy, thank you so much for your information about the Cubs. Hosanna and Shangile, the Cubs names, if I pronounce that correctly, both born on the 2nd of February. Thank you so much, Wendy. Really br brilliant information. And uh, they're born the same month that I am, so I won't forget these little guys. But look at that. Look at Karula. Isn't she just fantastic? And look at those paws. This is those... those moments that you just don't forget folks we talked about uh, moments before that you have with wildlife and today for me this is one of those moments i've i've really really wanted to see karula and i didn't think i was going to get a chance uh, but sure enough first drive out the lucky porcupine quill folks i think uh, had a little rub on us today She's just relaxing there. So we were just with Brian, um, sorry, Brian, Brian's with me. Um, we were just with James with uh, those wonderful cats. And, uh, and we crossed over to see Karula but just before we got to you you joined us uh, on this cut we she just went up that tree like absolutely effortlessly just effortlessly and that's what makes these cats without a doubt the most versatile broadest habitat tolerant cat in Africa um, you know, they will live from uh, anywhere in lowland rainforest. Um, and in, in many lowland rainforests in Africa, they're the only uh, large predator, or the largest of predators. Excuse me, I'm just touching my microphone here because it's uh, falling off my hat. We've got these little microphones stuck under our hats now, which allow us to turn any direction, but it just fell off. So I do apologize for those little pops you heard. Um, so yeah, they can be adapted to those lowland rainforests, to, to deserts, and the highest mountains. I mean, leopard have actually been found entombed in the Kilimanjaro ice cap. So, I mean, they, they are absolutely incredible. I use the word absolutely because it's, it's one of those things, I just find them so beautiful. And when we've got animals that are habituated like this, so conditioned, so relaxed around us. It is a great feeling that the conservation work and the, whether it be tourism or whether it be proper habituation process that happen with these leopards, you can obviously see that they've worked. Because what we have in front of us, folks, is far from a stressed out leopard. <laughs> that is for sure. Beautiful. Oh, she's so great. I, I do. So whilst we're with this beautiful girl, um, and her little cubbies are down there playing around, uh, I can still, I'll keep my eye on them for her and for you. Um, we might just reposition a little bit back and we're going to cross over and see what James is up to. I hope he's still with those lines. We'll see you just now. We've left the lines, everyone. Um, there are three vehicles in there now, all enjoying the sighting. Um, I'd really, like I say, I'd love to take some kind of credit for finding them. Herbert pulled off an amazing tracking job today, I've got to tell you. Following these lions hard ground through the middle of the um, through the middle of the block here, it was a, a truly spectacular tracking feat, and I'm 
I mean, I'm thoroughly in awe, and I, I really wish I could do the same sort of thing, but I'm afraid my skills don't extend to that. While we were tracking, we did find this fragment of elephant tusk, and of course it's illegal to have ivory, so it will be deposited into the bush once I've left it, and no one will ever find it again. But it's just a, a tiny little fragment of tusk, but the tusk itself, I think this is quite near the tip, must have been a really impressively sized tusk. Here are my hands. I suspect at its, well, round about where this broke, it was about that fat. So at the base, it would have been around that size. Now that is, that's pretty impressive. What's that? It's about half a foot in diameter. Just listening there. I, the feeling, the, the feeling of what we've just experienced is astounding. Um, as Herbert said, Herbert was given a rev by those females uh, two days ago when he found them on the kill. He found them on the waterbuck kill with the cubs and with, um, the fee with the two males. And they gave him a rev, which means basically they charged him because they were so upset with him. And obviously that's always something you're worried about when, you, when you're tracking lions. As long as you stand still, you're normally okay. These ones saw us before we saw them because we were up and down the road trying to find their tracks. And then they stood up and some impalas started alarm calling. So we stopped and we looked and that's when Herbert managed to spot them, having tracked them so far across the bush. Um, and then we just had that amazing sighting with you. Hardly a view, not the best lion view that you'll ever have, but to do it on foot like that, I have to tell you, is just... Well, it's a rare experience, and it's a profoundly wonderful experience. So I hope you all enjoyed it. <laughs> ah. I think at their closest, they were probably, when they came bolting out the bush there to chase the warthogs, they were probably at their closest, I don't know, 40 or 50 meters from us. So they were never that close. That's about 150, 200 feet. They were never that close. But if they chased that warthog, Vim said, imagine if they chased that warthog towards us, then what would have happened? Well, they would have ignored us completely. They would have focused entirely on the warthog, and I've actually had that experience before on foot. You see lions bolting out of the bush, and they're chasing something else. They kind of look at you, and then they just keep on going. So we would have been perfectly safe. And when the warthog went, as they do, um, we, I thought it had been killed, but it hadn't, and it wasn't caught. Phew! Brilliant stuff. <laughs> and you've got Karula as well. And you're absolutely right, everybody. Herbie is amazing. Um, and it's, uh, I've mentioned, I've spoken quite long about this, this skill of tracking. And, you know, you find these, um, you come into an area like this and you find young guys like me 15 years ago or so, I'm not so young anymore, um, guiding and you've got your big rifle and you've got your short shorts and your, your Land Rover and you think you're a big deal. And on the front of the car, if you're lucky, is a guy like Herbert, who is actually your real bush teacher. And while your guests give you the credit for the animals that you see, it is almost always down to men like Herbert who carry the last vestiges of an ancient culture of tracking, and especially amongst the Shangan people. Shangan people are a very small um, tribe, small grouping in South Africa, and it's with them, because of the Kruger Park probably, that the last vestiges of this real great tracking skill resides, actually in the culture, as opposed to um, a learning sort of, a learned behavior. Down, If you go down to KwaZulu-Natal, you'll find very good Zulu trackers. Um, but they haven't learnt it in the same way as these guys have. They've kind of learnt it on the job. These fellows have learnt it from when they were tiny little boys. Just brilliant. <laughs> and while there's Gurley, I will give I will give Herbert a big shangan thank you. I'm not going to shout it to him because we are walking through the bush and there are lions there. So you would say to him, he can say ngopfu, Herbert. He can see ngopfu, which means that we're very grateful indeed. And so we are. Let's head back across to Hayden and the Queen of Juma. Well, from one 
incredibly skillful tracker to another incredibly skillful hunter. Herbie, um, an amazing, amazing tracker, and uh, James, James is very, very kind words uh, about him, and it's totally true. It's just you, you just want to be able to stand next to Herbie, and hopefully through osmosis you pick up some of his knowledge. But back to where we are now with this magnificent cat who she's got her eyes on something down there the cubs are just down below her but she's very very focused on something now what we always keep our eyes open for is you know there'll be there could be an unsuspecting other hoofed animal walking up or a herbivore or anything but also i um, just got to keep their, eye, their eyes out for uh, hyena so, but all the, the cubs are, you know, what's that, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, you know, the cubs are um, seven months old now, but look at how beautiful her face is, have a look at that, Brian's just coming back up, she's like very, very alert at the moment, and I just want to also just um, state some facts, folks, um, I said to you that we're about 15 feet away from her at nearly eye level, that's why we've got these incredible shots. Now, we would never drive up to a leopard like this. Um, she came to us. We were parked here watching her in the gully, uh, that little drainage line. Then she came up the hill. We stayed put. And then she actually ascended this tree. So I just want you to know that um, I didn't want to start the car then and scare her or do anything. So I just stayed put. But um, normally we wouldn't drive up to a leopard this close in a tree because it might disturb her and send her down the tree so always taking incredible care with what we do with the animal um, but I just wanted to you know formally tell you why we're so close and that's because she came to us uh, and just laid in that tree there she's definitely focused on something down there transfixed so you can hear the voice of somebody else we have another vehicle with us um, and they're enjoying this beautiful sighting as well picture perfect incredible There's something that sort of comes over you when you get this close to a leopard and anyone that has been close to a leopard in the wild that's watching today will know that feeling and hopefully you still get that feeling through Safari Live as well. But just to give you a bit more information, the sheer beauty of these cats is in our faces right now, uh, so close and personal that, boy, did uh, nature get this one right? Nature gets it all right, really. But this is uh, definitely one of my favorite, favorite animals in the world. Brian, what I might do, mate, is uh, we've got her face there. I'm just thinking about, folks, if I reversed up a little bit, we might get a bit more of a, a shot of where she is. But I'm trying to see the little guys. They're down the other side there. You think we should reposition? Yeah, we can. yeah let's give it a try, folks. So I'm just going to try that. Well, this is a great comment from Aaron in New Zealand. And before I start the car and reposition, Aaron, absolutely wonderful words from you. Um, Aaron's saying that the first time he watched uh, 
a documentary in his life. He watched David Attenborough speaking about nature, and he was absolutely in awe uh, about the beauty of nature, and that stuck with him. So that's um, that's great to hear, and that's your love, love nature switch flicking moment there, and we've all got one, mate. So thank you so much for watching in New Zealand, which it's twenty past. Uh, late o'clock <laughs> in the morning for you mate so welcome aboard mate great to have you with us so you can see Karula's not fussed there really with us starting the vehicle she's just put her head down I've just got to watch we've got some seriously spiky branches behind us so I'm just manoeuvring past actually I might just Brian can you get a shot of the cub there through the over the other side not sure it's just on that bank over there mate is that all right oh yeah that's probably the best I'm going to get folks at the moment um, that's a little cubby there and I don't know which one but uh, then we've got mum and one of our her little cubs down there So they have about one to three cubs in a litter and not all of them survive because there's a high mortality rate but she's such an incredible mother, she's done so well and she's raised two of her cubs to this ripe seven month age that they're at now and they're looking beautiful aren't they? Normally happens about every two years, two year intervals roughly Sometimes it differs, you know, you can read many a book and many of the sort of fact sheets on all different animals and there's always exceptions to the rule and folks that know me will always know that I say that because, you know, books say, oh, look, they're mostly active at dawn and dusk and, you know, I've seen leopards hunting in Tanzania in the middle of the baking heat in the day. So, look, it just depends on different individuals and different locations. But generally speaking... Um, Every two years they'll they'll have cubs. So there. we have a beautiful, beautiful cat. And we're going to just sit with Karula for a bit because I can't really leave and I hope it's all right with you. After I haven't seen her for seven months, uh, I'm more than happy just to sit here with this, this beautiful, beautiful cat and her cubs. But we're going to cross back to a very, very wonderful human being, Mr. James Hendry. We'll see you just now. I'm embarrassed by that compliment, everybody especially as the credit for the afternoon goes to Herbert. There is a floppy-eared bull elephant there. Can you see it? And that I didn't spot either. Fiam spotted that. So all I've done today is uh, talk to you and explain what the uh, masters of the wilderness have found. Now, I believe this is the same elephant that you saw earlier at the waterhole. Hayden said to me, there are a few bulls around here, and that's not surprising. It's dry. They'll be having nice things to drink at the water hole there. It's uh, one, one of probably the last source of fresh water that there is out here because it pumped from that very same pump that I showed you very early on when I was still driving. Now that elephant's quite a distance from us. He's probably about 150 meters, I would say, which is about 500 feet. I'm pretty sure he's seen us because they've got pretty good eyesight. It's probably a bit like ours, maybe a slightly myopic human being but he's not worried by us at all. Because we're not hiding from him, we're not behaving like predators at all, we're behaving well. I mean, he knows what we are. Now, it was exactly the same with those lions. Those lions saw us. We didn't go crouching then behind bushes. We didn't then try and go into the thickets after them. We behaved precisely as we should have. And so they didn't feel any threat. 
They lay down in the thickets there, and Herbert reckons that two of them stayed to watch us. One female moved the cubs away, and then two of them would have stayed to see what we were doing. Um, and we didn't behave like predators, and so they left us alone. Same thing with this elephant now. Let's see where he goes. I think he's probably going to come out into the open. Let's move down here a little bit. I'm not even going to check the wind. I mean, I can feel it blowing from straight in front of us. I'm not even going to check it, though, because he's, I'm 99% sure he's seen us. Yeah, we get quite a nice view of him here. There we go. It's a very good question, Rebecca. You're in Santa Barbara, you say. Are there any female trackers, Shangan trackers? I have known one in my life. Herbie, have you? One. Guiding now. Uh, Herbie's also known only one, and she's guiding now. Yeah, the elephant is now facing us. Yeah, he's coming out towards us. We're not too far from Fireside Chat, so if we have to move, we can. But I think he's actually going to that tree. Um, and Rebecca, you're in Santa Barbara. We're just going to move a little bit around here while we answer your question. Um, you I mean, to be, to be honest, South African society is still very patriarchal. It's very stratified into roles, especially in the rural areas. And so tracking is not seen as a woman's job at all. Um, as I've said to you before, though, I think that women make better guides than men. Because if you've ever seen someone like Jamie Patterson guiding... There's no testosterone in what she does. So it's purely, you know, her, she's extremely brave, but there's no ego involved, which means that she's sensitive, but she's not scared. And that is a brilliant approach if you want to be in the bush. So I imagine there, will be some, there would be some wonderful female trackers. And I think that as time goes on and the sort of thing opens up to women, they will do it a lot more. But... The original skills, remember, because of the stratified nature of society, come largely from the men because they're the ones who look after the cattle when they're little boys. And that is when they learn the tricks of being in the bush and how to track. That's when it first begins. Nice question. Thank you, Rebecca. Isn't that lovely? A perfect way to end our little bushwalk. It's been quite exciting, really. Okay. We're going to move off towards the fireside chat. Now, if you look over there, you might just be able to see a bit of light. And that's where we're going to meet you shortly. Hayden is still with Karula, so we're going to head back across to him now. And I will see you by the fireside. Well, folks, I just repositioned and she turned her head around and gave us this magnificent shot to finish our drive on today. And how beautiful is that? It doesn't come much more quintessentially African than that. Juma, Sabi Sands, South Africa, you always deliver. And you deliver in such a way with your magnificent creatures that I think everyone uh, watching this right now is uh, probably going to have a very, very beautiful image in their mind to finish their day wherever you are in the world. I feel incredibly privileged to be sitting here with this cat, as Brian does, and uh, every single leopard encounter and sighting you have, you never forget that that is just magic. Just taking a few images, folks, because she is just in such a great spot. So apologies about the, the noise.
Just got a question from Dina. Excuse me, folks, again, my microphone. I'm so sorry about that. My microphone has just come off my cap, so apologies for sticking that on there. Um, Dina has just asked, is that Karula snoring? No, it's not Dina. Um, it might be just a bird that you heard in the background. There was a Franklin vocalising before, and sometimes the sounds can... Uh, <laughs> they can sort of not fit the pictures, but um, yeah, no, she's not snoring, maybe at the moment. Ah, oh, that's just beautiful, isn't it? So I'm just watching the time, folks, because I do have to uh, get going in about three minutes, which is an incredibly difficult thing for me to do, I can tell you that, but we have to do meet uh, James at the fireside chat, so I think we've been very, very fortunate. <laughs> oh, she's going to turn around the other side by the looks of things anyway. Look at that. Have a look at that spot pattern. It's just, when you see a leopard lying like this, you do get that full representation of how beautiful their spots are when they're elevated like that, all the way down the inside of their legs, the darker spots, not the rosettes, and then the rosettes all over. And every individual is different. It is their fingerprint. And nature has got that. In one, she <laughs> can't quite get quite comfortable at the moment. So, folks, I'm going to have to. Whilst we've just got those beautiful pictures happening there, I'm going to just uh, give you a little farewell from me for a minute. Uh, whilst we drive up, we're going to have to leave Karula. Um, sadly, because I could sit here with her uh, until dark here. Uh, but we've got to go up to the fireside chat, and that's also a great thing because we'll get to be able to have a bit of a chat about this. But she has got this kill here. There's a good chance she'll be here tomorrow um, if hyena don't get this tonight. She may put it up a tree. We will find out. We know where she is, and um, we will come back here first thing in the morning to uh, see if she's here. So without further ado, I just put my earpiece back in so I can hear F FC, final control. And I want to say thank you for doing it or being here. So we do need to bo move on. Um, goodbye, my dear friend. You have been absolutely amazing as usual. Cubbies, till another day. And how cool was that? You never know what's around the next corner. Ah. Yeah. It's good. All is, right in the world. All is right in the world. I feel sensational is a word that probably I could use. I feel fantastic. I feel when you see, have an encounter with nature like that, like we all just had, it just makes you feel brilliant. You know, just brilliant. There's a great uh, environmental lawyer by the name of Gus Seth, Gus Speth, I think his name is, yes, yeah, Speth. And he wrote a quote once that I read, uh, and it stuck with me for a very long time. And the quote was something along the lines of, um, he's been studying science for the last 30 years of his life, and, you know, he thought that, well, after that sort of, that many years studying what he was studying and uh, being at the top of his game, he thought that they knew how to tackle climate change and habitat loss and all those sorts of things. But he came to a realization in this quote, and I'm sort of paraphrasing, I'm not paraphrasing, I'm just sort of trying to put it together for you to give you the gist of what it was, because I can't remember it word for word. But it was basically along the lines that 
he realized suddenly he had this eureka moment one day that we need to actually the problems in the world aren't necessarily just habitat loss and climate change and and so on but they're greed cynicism and apathy and he said as a scientist i can't fix that he said we need a spiritual and cultural change in the world to love wildlife again to love the environment to love the habitat so that's why i asked about that love nature switch when it was flicked in you when you were a kid or when you're an adult for that matter and uh that really stuck with me, that, that, uh, that little quote when I read it from, from Gus. A spiritual and cultural change. You know, when we're little kids, we just love. Everything is amazing. And as we get older, we get apathetic and we don't really care as much. Or we haven't got time. And when you have a moment like that, which we all just did together as a team, oh my gosh, makes your heart sing makes your heart sing. South Africa, you're all right. You're all right. Okay, so whilst we go down Filaments dip here, who I haven't been down this little road, which I haven't been down. We're going to cross over to the one and only James Henry that has another very special creature. We'll see you now. We just thought we'd give you one more view of this elephant, everybody. He's sitting there. You can see his bottom disappearing behind some bush. And what we'll do is just go up onto this termite mound over here and see if we can't get a last look just before we go to the fireside chat. Hayden's got quite a long way to drive. So we're just going to have a look quickly before he gets here. Wind is good for us. It's still coming out of the north at the moment. And sometimes of an evening we come and sit on this termite mound and have sundowners, which of course is an excellent thing to do. I can't see him anymore, Vian. wind is still good so we won't be worried about it. We wouldn't be doing this if we weren't right next to the fireside there where there was light and vehicles. It's a bit, it's a little bit dark for this. There he comes now. He's got quite nice tusks there. Now he's, a, he's still a long way away from us everybody. He's a good 150 meters, 500 feet or so but you can see how easily they disappear, especially at this time of the night. Isn't that nice? And I wish you could hear some of the stuff here. Unbelievable sounds of the evening, the sort of late winter evening, blowing wind, a couple of those rain locusts or crested locusts going in the background. Bit of smoke in the air, some wood smoke from home, dust, wind, and of course the taste of victory on our tongues after Herbert found us those wonderful lions today. Okay, we'll go back to the fireside now. We'll see you there this time, I promise. How was that? <laughs> what a fantastic afternoon it's been, hey? Isn't this just brilliant? I'm so, so chuffed. I'm really excited to be back. And uh, that little kid inside me is jumping up and down. As I said earlier in the afternoon, having this opportunity and this honor to come back uh, and do a week. And after, in Fireside Chat, we'll explain a little bit more about the school's uh, programs over the next few days that I've come back to especially do. But, uh, wow, what an afternoon. Karula and elephants and, and, and. So I've got a question from Rob in New Jersey. Welcome aboard, Rob, and thanks for uh, joining us. And great to have you. Uh, 
A good question. Uh, how many countries have I worked and travelled in? Well, I haven't necessarily worked in all of them. I suppose I've travelled through some on holidays and things like that. But I'm up to a uh, an embarrassing 51 at the moment, I think. Uh, and I wouldn't have been able to have that opportunity if it wasn't for Nat Geo. Most of those I have done with National Geographic and I've been incredibly privileged. Here's this little stinky zookeeper from the suburbs of Sydney sitting in this vehicle here in this great land, South Africa, this amazing country that I'm driving around in this wonderful vehicle with wonderful people looking at the things I love. How'd that happen? I'll tell you that story another time. But uh, for, for me, I, I, I'm really privileged, mate, to be able to travel like I have. But I've also got a beautiful wife and son now, so I have a tendency to not try and travel as much. Uh, so I'm slowing down a little bit, mate. Getting a bit grey. Got a question from Dilly uh, in Wisconsin. Hi Dilly, welcome aboard to you. Great to have you with us. Uh, I've done a little bit of work up in Wisconsin myself uh, with some black bear, um, what was it? It was black bear monitoring with uh, radio collars and telemetry. So a great part of the world you're in. Uh, have I ever met Bindi Irwin? No, I haven't, uh, Dilly, and I, I'm, I know she is doing great work with kids. Um, but I haven't had the opportunity to meet her, but you never know what uh, could happen in the future there. But thank you very much for watching and being with us today. Just having a last little scratch around here to see if there's anything out around here on my way to meet James at the fireside chat. Okay, we're going to just uh, head over there now. I can smell elephant. I definitely can smell elephant. Uh, can I go through there? Can I go through there? I have to go around here. I do apologise. Uh, I've taken a little wrong route, but um, I'm going to get to James as quickly as I can. I can smell elephant. I can't see them. Ah, there we go. <laughs> That must be the one that, one that James, just over there, the one that James just had with him. He's just behind that bush. I could smell him, um, but I couldn't see him, but there he is. It might be our boy that was down at our water point with us. I'm just going to make a bit of a beeline now to meet James. What a great afternoon. And great to have you on board and all you new safarians that have joined us today. We hope we've hooked you. We hope you've uh, joined the Safari Live family because it is a big family. Um, wonderful people from the people that have that created this right from the beginning. Graham and Emily Wallington and Peter Bratt and those team to all the people behind the scenes as well. This incredible team in Final Control. Bex today, Kirsty, um, Jerry, Connor and everyone else, VM, just everyone. Um, and there's a big team behind this that makes it work. We, we just uh, get to drive around in the vehicles. Okay, so we're gonna cross over to James and I'll be right there in a minute. See you now. Hayden might be here in a minute, but so could a predator. I can hear Impala going ballistic behind us. Perhaps there's a leopard there at Gallego Pan. Welcome to the Fireside Chat, everybody. A 15-minute Fireside Chat we're going to be having. And we're going to be chatting ostensibly about the school's program that Hayden and the Taronga Zoo have put together all the way in Australia. And I'm going to attempt deeply not to try and put on an Australian accent when Hayden arrives. 
I have this dreadful habit of trying to emulate people I'm talking to. So I'm going to attempt it and I'm just going to do a little bit of it now so as to get it out of my system before he arrives here and I make a fool of myself in front of him. That will be all that I'll be doing in Australian this afternoon. For those of you who are in Australia, please forgive the uh, poorness of my Australian accent. Very nice. Okay, what an unbelievable drive we've had today. Incredible on foot stuff. We weren't going to go out on foot, of course. It was going to be just a nice uh, sort of two drives. One hoping to find lions, one hoping to find leopard. And uh, well, that did happen, but one of us, of course, was on foot. And I would urge you, any of you who are thinking about coming out to Africa on a safari, if you can include a walking safari, I promise you now you won't regret it. You don't have to be very fit. You don't have to be a great survivor man. You don't have to be a special forces operative. You've just got to be able to put one foot in front of the other for a couple of hours at a time and you can come on the most unbelievable trips because I promise you now, even though we get much better views of these animals in the vehicles and the vehicles are an extremely important part of what we do, to do a walking safari and see lions on foot like we saw them, to see elephants like that on foot, even though they're a long way away from where we are. I promise you it touches something very deeply within your soul and it was a profound privilege, especially like I said to you earlier, to walk with Herbert today. Uh, what a great joy that was. Um, Hayden is just behind us now, so I think while he is making his way in, let's go and have a look at the clip that he's made for what he's going to be doing here. Take a look at this. Hi guys, my name's Hayden Turner. The next time I talk to you, I'm going to be in Africa, but at the moment I'm right in here in Sydney's Taronga Zoo, where I currently work. I'm heading across to Africa to be a part of this fantastic program called Safari Live. We're going to broadcast live from Africa right into your very classroom. So get your teachers on board, look at all the links on this page, and get connected. We're going to come to you, you're going to be getting on the biggest safari vehicle on the planet. I'll see you in Africa. And here he is, everybody. Hello. How are you, mate? Right? Yes, good. good to see a good you, drive mate. back? Gosh, that was just a fantastic, absolutely fantastic afternoon. Not awful. Not awful, no. just amazing. Good. When we first started off, I felt uh, I'd brought the gremlins back with me. Yes, uh, <laughs> I thought you had as well. <laughs> so I was a bit concerned there, but thank you for your honourable gesture that you did and swapped vehicles with me. It was very kind of you. My pleasure. But you had a lovely uh, time seeing um, some creatures on foot. Unbelievable. Wow. But Tell mostly, me, talk me through that. I mean, the most, as I've been banging on about for some time now, the most amazing thing about it, of course, was finding the animals. Yep. But to witness Herbert's skill, yeah. as we walk through the bush was Incredible. profound. Yeah. Yeah. Right, we've look, looked at your clip. Nature uh, okay. is beautiful, <laughs> first of all, would like to know how long you're going to be with us, and then maybe you can go into a little bit more about the background of, of what it is that you're doing here. Sure, sure. Um, I'm here for about a week, probably until next Friday or Saturday. I'll probably have to leave Saturday, I can't quite remember the schedule. But we've got four days, um, dedicated hour each day in the morning from six till seven, that we've um, collaborated, Wild Earth and the Taronga Conservation Society, uh, we've collaborated uh, with this uh, sort of initiative to get Safari Live into as many schools as we possibly can in the state of New South Wales in Australia where I live. Now I've left the UK about four months ago, got offered a job back at the zoo uh, that I first started out in and we're going back there, we've moved back there, my wife and my boy and I and we're all there and um, I had a safari in Namibia to do and I thought there was a week in between, why don't we get this together? So what's going to happen is tomorrow morning we're going to go on drive, uh, we start at what time is it? Six o'clock. Six o'clock. So half an hour earlier than normal. Everybody. Yes, right, so we start at six o'clock, half an hour earlier than normal and from six till seven that will be two to three in the afternoon uh, in Australia and the kids, nearly three thousand of them mate, nearly 3,000 students and many of them that will never ever get this opportunity to see or experience this. We're going to give these kids an unforgettable life-changing experience. We may flick the love nature switch in some little kids tomorrow and uh, we've got about 80 to 100 schools I think so Brilliant. very excited mate and anything can happen. No script as you just saw in the bush here in this incredible country. I'm so lucky to be here. Yeah. It's great to have you here. Now, Aaron in New Zealand, which of course is across the... Uh, was that your uh, Scottish accent? No, yeah, yeah, it was a sort of a, a Scottish accent. <laughs> 
right. I, I told right. you it would happen, everyone. I warned you, and it has happened. Uh, Aaron in New Zealand, I think you're somewhere around Wellington, if I'm not mistaken, but I might be wrong. Anyway, you're interested in... <laughs> Sorry, I can't stop myself here. Um, you, you want to know what the best thing about being is, back is from Hayden. The best thing about being back, Aaron, is this team. I have to tell you, working with these guys is an absolute experience. <laughs> James will probably laugh about that experience in itself because it is like coming back to a family. Um, it couldn't happen without every individual in this team. But that combined, equally as important, this habitat and this, this particular place, Juma, Arethusa, Cheetah Plains and the surrounding areas that we are allowed tra to traverse mm. is just such a special part of the world. I often used to think that I was born in the wrong country, you know. I love Australia so much, but South Africa, you guys have got one of the most beautiful countries on the planet. We think it's the most beautiful country, absolutely. Uh, it is a really great place. Now, Cheryl, you want to know about um, young Master Turner and Master Turner. whether he is uh, as interested in animals and conservation as you are, what are his interests? He, Master Turner, Jack Turner, yes, turned 10. Don't forget that, James, when you meet him. It's right. not 9 anymore, he's 10. He's 10, got it. Big 10. He is doing very, very well. Uh, he's slotted into school and sport very well in Australia. Uh, he is interested in animals. He's got a very, very caring soul uh, about animals. I wouldn't say he's obsessed like his dad. Uh, which is great. You've got to let kids just be and whatever comes out naturally for them. Uh, he's a typical little boy, Pokemon Go <laughs> and everything else that goes with a little 10-year-old little boy and kids. But, you know, when I do get him into the wild and I do get him into places that um, have very, very special uh, components to it, whether it's an experience or whether it's the wildlife, he does really get connected. Okay. And that, that is great. That's a great feeling for me, that's right. for sure. And then it's not only, I mean, we'd, uh, there's a very special anniversary for your zoo. 100%, James. And what is that? Well, look, Taronga Zoo back in Sydney has been uh, around for 100 years this October. So it's our centenary uh, year and it's a very, very important time for us. Um, when I left the zoo, mm. uh, I worked there from about 89 to 98 and then I came to Africa and then... A beautiful woman walked into my world and I chased her around the world and we ended up in the UK. But we've gone back to Australia now, back to that same zoo. And when I left that zoo, it was still a great zoo. It did an incredible education, incredible conservation work and, of course, a recreational uh, facility for people to go and enjoy. But it's gone to the next level now, mate. It is absolutely incredible the amount of... It's an international brand that we are doing incredible things in the wild and the theme or the slogan for want of a better term for our zoos two of them one in sydney and one in dubbo our western mm -hmm. plains zoo which is an open plains zoo is called for the wild yeah. and that's we are a, a behavior change organization that manages a zoo now mm. i think that's a, a managed uh, i think just say that again we are a behavior change or a be sorry let's try that again just no, for me this time done. Yes. A behaviour change organisation that manages a zoo. Yeah. Now that's a pretty crucial thing because I mean, imagine there are viewers sitting there now thinking zoo is a terrible thing. Mm. And I know that I have pontificated about, I think especially in South Africa, the importance of zoos because we have hundreds, if not millions of kids who will yep. never come into the wild. And quite apart from the education, there's also a whole lot of research that goes on. Yep. There's a massive amount. It's a behaviour change Funding. organisation. Yeah. yeah. So when a person, well, you're exactly right, James. Everything you just said was absolutely perfect when it comes to what we try and do. Yeah. If you can get those little people, or adults alike, it's never too late to have that behaviour change. Yeah, they come through the doors, and if they walk out and change one behaviour in their mm -hmm. life to improve a habitat, uh, a climate change, or whatever it may be, Mm. Uh, we've done our job and they are facilities to do exactly that but Safari Live is also another angle for us to bring into the zoo and our yeah. education and I've just been so excited about this it's yeah. going to be a great four days folks Good. now we have a question from Gracie in Ohio Gracie uh, has two favourite animals her first one is a hippopotamus um, unfortunately they've been a little short on the ground sorry about that Gracie uh, hopefully the rains will bring them back and also elephants and she would like very much to know what your favourite is okay is this our Gracie this is our Gracie Gracie how are you <laughs> so good to hear you that's fantastic Gracie my favourite animals it's a hard question but I know 
Let's split it. Can we split it into African animals and then maybe maybe an Australian? <laughs> we, could, we could go all around the yeah. globe there. Giraffes are one of my favourite animals on the planet. There's no doubt about that. Giraffes are... I love. I've worked with them a lot. I've hand-reared a giraffe in a zoo. I was the daddy of a giraffe. I used to have to hold up a milk bottle for this giraffe to drink 15 litres. Or how many is that? That's about... That's three gallons. Three of, gallons yeah. or yeah. Of, Four gallons. Of, of milk a day. He was uh, on at one point, and uh, he was growing at a rate of knots. So giraffe are very important to me. Rhinoceros are very important to me. Uh, elephant. Chimps and, and gorillas as well. But then I also love some smaller things too. I'm really, really into insects and small things, like you are. We've had some mm. fine times in the tent yes. uh, when we were up here on Big oh, Cat wonderful. Week. And just yeah. tiny little things like those stingless bees yes. that had the little nest in the back of the giraffe skull. So Gracie, in a nutshell, everything but giraffes, rhinos, elephants, leopards, yeah. lions, cheetah, <laughs> wild dog. I'll stop Lots. that. Great to right. hear from you. Thank you, Gracie. Uh, we'll stop him there. Now, Geoffrey, you, you say you agree that zoos are the most important, edu or play an incredibly important educational role, but you want to know if Taronga A has leopards, because obviously leopards are very um, dear to the people here. How do they adapt? Um, we don't have leopards. Uh, but you're exactly right, zoos do, do play a, a very, very important role in conservation and more so today than ever. Uh, so fantastic uh, for highlighting that for us. We don't have leopards, um, it's just a species that we haven't got. Uh, I think some zoos have a tendency, or some of the better zoos in the world, uh, have a tendency to have species that occur in their region. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm. You have a better impact sometimes if you're focusing on species that are actually adapted to the climate they're living in. Yeah. Uh, there's definitely, you know, there's always room for improvement. There's always changes. But I think it's, there's a really great uh, paper that's just come out and, and I think I mentioned it in Drive just a second ago, James, but results or research has shown that bombarding people with facts mm. constantly doesn't, doesn't necessarily work. work. Mm. The story and that's why Safari Live and Taronga Zoo and all what we do, the story is king. Yeah. And people follow that story. If they get on board with that story and follow that story, then you've got them. You've got them as they're your, your change agents. They're yeah. your soldiers in your yeah. army. Yeah. So um, we, we really try and do that. But Which I think to a large extent is why we um, why tourism here is such an important facet of things. I mean, obviously not everyone's going to be able to do this, but we do hope desperately that the people come here leave here changed and will go home just with a, a touch, a feeling of wilderness and that they will absorb that and the zoo I suppose the first step to that. Absolutely. Then slightly less seriously, you um, you were operating in Surrey of course which is yeah. a very pretty part of England. Mm. Um, I've always thought that uh, you know it's a kind of a wind in the willows type of a thing and even though not huge animals are a beautiful part of the world, oh, right? Absolutely, mate. Absolutely. It doesn't matter where you are in the world. And folks, I've said this to you many times before, and I think all of us on Safari Live agree, and there's, well, there's a big pool of us out there in the world that believe every single habitat matters. Yeah. You know, we, we get bombarded with really beautiful, big, gorgeous megafauna all the time on documentaries mm. but you know we've seen some of the most incredible things on safari live that you've been down lying down on the ground you yeah. know like waxing lyrically about some caterpillar yeah. yeah and and brent leo smith um stefan and everyone uh has just had such an incredible sort of understanding of the small stuff yeah. as well and i think when we share that like surrey did didn't have a lot of big mammals mm. but had unbelievable beauty mm. butterflies invertebrates, flowers, birds, and small mammals, yeah. you have to get kids excited yeah. about that as well because it all matters. Yeah. Great stuff. All right, everyone, that's going to be it from us now. Um, just a reminder to you that we are, of course, going to be live for the whole of the week in the morning, 15 minutes earlier, so from 6 o'clock to 9 o'clock in the morning. A huge big welcome back to Hayden Turner. Lovely Thanks, to mate. have you with it's us. It's an absolute pleasure. And I hope that you will join us. It will be ostensibly for the schools in the morning. The afternoons will run precisely as they have. Thanks for joining us today. We'll see you tomorrow at 0600. Bye-bye. Thank you, guys.